Hi, I'm Stephen Prince. We're going to do something a little unusual with the track for this film. Seven Samurai is a movie about groups, groups of warriors, and it seems fitting, therefore, to give it to a group of scholars to comment upon. It's a film written about by many people, and we're going to give an opportunity to some of them to talk about its significance. This has been called the greatest Japanese film ever made, and so it is. With this picture, Kurosawa revolutionized the samurai film genre and made a film so brilliant and so entertaining that it became one of the most influential films ever, spawning countless remakes, official and unofficial, all over the world. From any angle you choose, scripting, storytelling, acting, directing, camera work, editing, this film is a masterpiece. Every element in it is superlative. Fumio Hayasaka's music score, for example, is one of the best ever written for cinema, and this percussive opening creates tremendous excitement and anticipation about what is to come. But Kurosawa's friend and longtime composer was dying of tuberculosis when he created this music, and he'd only make one more picture with Kurosawa. Seven Samurai transformed Kurosawa's career and film style. He was coming off nearly a decade of contemporary life films that explored modern Japan during and after the war. It's hard to believe this now, but he had never made a samurai film before. He'd done two period pictures with samurai in them, Rashomon and The Man Who Tread on the Tiger's Tail, but these were not Chambara, swordplay films. This then was his first picture to deal with samurai as fighting men, and it was Kurosawa's first venture into the Sengoku period, the 16th century civil wars that he became the most important filmmaker to depict. Most samurai films before Kurosawa were set in later periods, often the 17th and 18th centuries, but Kurosawa was drawn to the chaos of the civil wars because the class lines then were very fluid and open, and there was a great deal of social rebellion that appealed to him. The Sengoku Civil War period was a very complex period of lots and lots of battles, but it had a common start point in 1467 with the Onin War. A quarrel over who would become the new shogun triggered this war in 1467, which devastated the capital city of Kyoto and weakened the ruling political authority. This allowed the regional warlords, the daimyo, to emerge as independent chieftains in their own provinces, and they began fighting with one another over territory. These civil wars lasted until 1568, when Japan's most powerful warlord, Nobunaga Oda, began his campaign to unify the country. Kurosawa loved characters who were stubborn, just like himself, and his movies at this time center on rebel heroes. So the Sengoku period was a natural one for him. Rebellion against political authority was so extensive then that the era became known as Gakokujo, a time when the low rebel against the high. Much of that rebellion involved peasants rising up against their oppressors and often through alliances with local samurai. This is the remarkable history that Kurosawa built his film on, and that I'll say more about later on in the commentary. This is a very extensive credit sequence, and the length of the sequence is really fitting to the epic scale of the film. A slow fade now to this remarkable horizon shot as Kurosawa introduces the film's villains, a marauding band of ronin, or independent samurai, with these striking backlit horizon shots. Now, coming up here in just a moment, we'll see a camera operator has some trouble panning and following the action. Throughout the scene, Kurosawa insists on a slight disjunction of image and sound. We've got a lot of long shots of the riders coupled with audio close-ups of the thudding horse's hooves, one of Kurosawa's signature methods of combining image and sound. In the Sengoku period, all a samurai needed to achieve some degree of power was an ability to convince other samurai that they should follow him. Our rebel leader is a guy who's done just that. He's got an alliance of local samurai who've agreed to band with him, very typical of the period. And as you can see, Kurosawa characterizes him not by name, but visually through his Kawari Kabuto, one of the period's extraordinary helmets, worn to call attention to the individual in this case with its horns acting as heraldry to announce his status. And note how quick and elegant is the setup to the whole film. A few lines of dialogue give us the premise, and then there's a visual showing us that the farmers overhear this, done without dialogue at all. Great interplay of foreground action and background action, a wipe, a few axial cuts to closer shots, and you can see how swiftly and subtly Kurosawa introduces the motif of the circle, 
which is fundamental to the visual design of the film. We have a circular grouping of huts and the farmers are clustered in a circle. And Kurosawa is going to use circular camera moves later in the film and the samurai will be represented as circles on the battle flag and on the tally sheet tracking bandit dead. It's a powerful design because the circle is an organic emblem of unity, but the symbol is also rooted in the history that Kurosawa is drawing on. In the Sengoku period, many local samurai banding together in acts of political rebellion signed pledges with their signatures arranged in a circle to signify that they were equal amongst each other. The circle motif then has one of its roots in the period, and it emblemizes exactly the theme that Kurosawa will pursue in the film. The end of hierarchy and class distinction, and in their place, an organic community built on fraternity and equality. Although, in the story, this ideal will finally fail, it remains the utopian aspiration that Kurosawa is reaching for in the film. This character rising now is Rikichi, played with great intensity by Yoshio Tsuchiya, whose first film this was. And the whimpering farmer, Yohei, is played by the great Bokuzin Hidari, one of Kurosawa's regular actors here playing his most endearing character. Kurosawa gives us a lot of close-ups in this film, playing on the faces of his actors in a way that you don't find as often in his later films. One of the things that changes in Kurosawa's work is that he starts using telephoto lenses extensively, like he's doing in this shot here. And you can see the way they compress perspective so radically. He's been a wide-angle filmmaker before this, but from now on, the flattening effect you see here will be part of all of his films. That's one way that Seven Samurai changed his work. Manzo's remark about farmers being born to suffer is echoed in other dialogue and scenes throughout the film. And indeed, Kurosawa uses the farmers as a kind of universal emblem of human suffering and endurance. His treatment of this idea is very powerful, but it's also part of his extraordinary transformation of history into epic poetry. In fact, the farmers in the period were anything but the passive creatures that we see here. They rose up in hundreds of violent political rebellions, and as a result, provincial authorities allowed many farming villages to govern themselves and to operate with a great deal of independence. This independence was one of the revolutionary things about the period, and Kurosawa implies that the village here has achieved something of that status. Now this shot is wonderful. This composition, the telephoto perspective, reinscribes Rikichi back into the group that he has, in a sense, just rebelled against and walked away from. The composition and the lenses work metaphorically throughout the film. Kurosawa's most profound statement in this movie is about the power of groups and about the relation between the individual and the group. And he translates these ideas with brilliance into purely visual forms throughout the film, taking the abstraction of the ideas and giving them concrete visual life. That's part of what makes this movie so great. Hayasaka and Kurosawa use the chorus to suggest the elemental power of the peasantry as a class that historically endures, in contrast to the samurai, the class which is doomed and is linked with the dead in the film's final shot. We're coming up now on one of my favorite moments in all of Kurosawa, the three axial shots that take us in close on the mill's water wheel. Watch closely and you'll see that the cutting is just off the beat of the music to add tension and interest. It's such a wonderful flourish. It's almost like jump cutting. It's a propulsive, rhythmic way of getting us into the scene and creating uh, visual exclamation points. You could take any four minutes of this film anywhere in the picture and find more concentrated filmmaking genius than you'll find anywhere else in cinema. One reason the movie plays so well is that it's so lean that the scenes are extremely compact, and here's a great example. This is the scene that kicks the story into action and gets us out of the setup. The village elder tells them to go hire samurai, and in the splendid joke that closes the scene, to find hungry samurai. Note the frontality of Kurosawa's playing style. Throughout much of the scene, like here, he has actors facing the camera directly. It's a compositional style that he's going to keep with him and even intensify in the coming decades when he'll shoot many of his later films with only two cameras, one of them head on to the actors as here. Throughout the scene, Kurosawa swiftly reinforces our emerging sense of the individual farmers. 
Rikichi greets the elder's decision with excitement, while Manzo here, as you can see, is more cautious and conflicted. They're going to have arguments at various points in the film. Kurosawa uses these subplots to create a sense of unity to the huge narrative. And there's the joke that concludes the sequence. And we go with a wipe, one of Kurosawa's best wipes ever, to this samurai hunt. And look fast there, there's Tatsuya Nakadai making his first appearance in a Kurosawa film. We get a series of uh, swish pans, rapid pans back and forth, as the farmers watch the samurai strut their stuff in the village. There's a wonderful sense of machismo on display here. Kurosawa clearly loves the male world. He's always been drawn to it, and this is the first film where he's really going to get to give full expression to that excitement, that pleasure he takes in the company of men. The scene climaxes with an impressive rejection from a haughty samurai. Watch the way Kurosawa goes into it. It's a shockwave of energy that scatters that crowd. Kurosawa is so good at handling movement on screen and his sudden shifts from relatively still sequences like the scene in the mill to this energetic business in the village square here with the samurai is just really staggering stuff. His point in all of this is that most samurai are either too vain, too ambitious, or too venal and corrupt to help the farmers. The seven who do finally accept are unusual men. They are not typical of their class. Instead, they represent its highest ideals, but in actual life, these ideals are rarely encountered. Kurosawa gives us in our seven samurai the most glorious vision of heroism that he'll ever fashion, but he balances that heroism with a candid portrait of the rather fallen qualities of day-to-day -day samurai. Time is passing now. As I've mentioned, Seven Samurai is the transitional film that takes Kurosawa to his widespread use of telephoto lenses, and you can see their effects in this group shot. But he's not yet given up wide-angle shots, as you can see here, where he's got Rikichi's face right in the camera. That's the way his films before Seven Samurai tended to look. But after this film, we're going to see that look very, very infrequently in his career. Throughout the film, Kurosawa counterpoints the suffering of the farmers with the stoicism and prowess of the samurai as a basic distinction between these classes. And yet it's their common history that really forms the spine of this movie, a commonality that Kurosawa distilled from the research that he did during pre-production. As I mentioned, the history that inspired the film lay in the political rebellions by samurai and peasant that were so common in the Sengoku period. These were so common, in fact, as to be called iki, a name that was given to them to designate their special status. It designated the act of rebellion as well as the group that carried it out. There were different names for Iki depending on who was participating. Tsuchi Iki were large-scale protests carried out by hundreds of farmers. Hyakusho Iki were uprisings led by the very lowest strata of peasantry. And Kuni Iki were bands of samurai who rose up against local gentry and warlords. These iki among the farmers were a great problem for the warlords in the period, and many villages, in fact, used rebellions to achieve their independence. In fact, in central Japan, farming villages defended themselves by constructing moats around their periphery. Kurosawa in the film will give this detail to the samurai. He has the samurai direct the farmers to construct a moat. But in fact, farmers in the Sengoku period were building moats as a natural accompaniment to protest activity. In most cases, these uprisings and protests were separate. The farmers and samurai did not collaborate, but there are numerous indications of instances where they did. What Kurosawa has done in the film is to combine these twin currents and give us the story of an iki, a protest movement, the alliance of our seven samurai with the farming village, and to tell that story from the birth of this protest movement to its summit and then its dissolution as the allies part ways. Envisioning this alliance of farmer and samurai, he again drew from existing historical models. In the Sengoku period, the twin currents of protest did come together. There are numerous instances of farmer and samurai fighting on behalf of one another. Frightened by this emerging alliance in the 15th century, the shogunate issued several proclamations forbidding samurai from participating in large-scale rebellions with the farmers and threatening to seize their property if they disobeyed. 
and demands from protesters often included debt cancellation for samurai as well as farmers. An essential part of the Iki ideal was equality. Iki were voluntary associations that broke with existing class hierarchies. In this respect, Seven Samurai reflects the 16th century time period of the story and becomes as well a very contemporary film for Kurosawa, because in it he explores Iki-based ideals of equality and individualism in ways that connect with the post-war era in Japan and the reforms of the Allied occupation that stress these very ideals. In his historical films, of which Seven Samurai is his first full-blooded example, Kurosawa always finds a portrait of the present in the past. And so part of what he's reflecting on here are the ideals of democracy and individualism bequeathed by the occupation, and he's finding a powerful basis for them in the Iki phenomenon of the Sengoku era. But he's also finding some very powerful traditions arrayed against them. And so a basic question that Kurosawa explores in the film is this. To what extent is individual equality a real possibility, or is it rather a tragic ideal doomed to failure? It's not that Kurosawa is being critical of the ethic of individuality that the occupation left, but in this film he's reflecting upon it. He's looking to his past, the past of his culture, and he's finding this period in the 16th century where there were these protests that were based around the notion of equality and classlessness. And he's setting that against the tradition of classes and a hierarchy. He's looking at his own present society where the political model that he's living through in 1954 is individualism, equality bequeathed by the occupation. And he's asking himself, to what extent are these real viable possibilities? And so in the movie, he finds this moment at near the end where the organic society of equality really emerges. It's that moment where the peasants bring their food down and share with the samurai and they fraternize. And that there's a sense of a, a different way that human beings can live with one another. Of course, the tragedy is that it's very fragile and it's a moment that is quickly lost. And in the final moments of the film, all of the old hierarchies re-emerge. <laughs> Another argument with Rikichi and Manzo, and in fact this was the very first scene that Kurosawa filmed, and the movie wasn't really shot in continuity, few films are, but this was the first one that they did, and he's using light and shadow here to add a lot of energy to the sequence. You can see the way it's, the shadows are playing over Rikichi's face. And once again, the extreme use of close-up in the film to heighten the actor's expressions. And the way that the wipe there takes us aggressively to the scene that brings in our main character and the man who will be the leader of the Seven Samurai, Kambi Shimada, played by Takashi Shimura. Shimura has just finished playing a frail dying clerk for Kurosawa the year before in Ikiru, and his robust performance in Seven Samurai is one of the greatest transformations of an actor that you'll ever see in the history of cinema. In this scene, Kurosawa is also going to bring in two of our other seven, Katushiro and Kikuchio. This entire scene is taken from a famous samurai legend. Kurosawa based many of the seven samurai on actual figures, and Kambei is modeled on Kame Izumi Izanokami, who lived from 1508 to 1577. Like many samurai, Izanokami traveled the countryside studying Zen Buddhism and trying to deepen his spiritual outlook. A famous episode from his life finds him in a village where a thief has kidnapped a child, and Izanokami disguises himself as a Buddhist monk by shaving his head, just like Kambi's doing here, and wearing the monk's robe in order to get close to the thief. And just as Kambi's going to do, he distracts the thief by offering him rice balls and then snatches the child to safety. Now you can see how startled everyone is by Kambi's gesture here. It's a monumental gesture for a samurai to cut his top knot because it was one of the emblems of his elite status. Thus one might say that Kambi's gesture here symbolizes his willingness to discard his class heritage in order to help the misfortunate. But Kurosawa actually felt that this gesture fulfilled one of the highest of samurai ideals, to protect the weak members of society. So even though he's cutting off his badge of samurai identity, Kambi is behaving the way an honorable samurai should. 
Kurosawa borrowed other attributes of Izanokami for the character of Kambe. Izanokami founded one of the most famous schools of sword fighting, Shinkaga Ryu, the Heart Reflection School. In it, he sought to turn the enemy's strengths into weaknesses, to build strategy based on the enemy's advantages, to make defense into offense. And now this is exactly what Kambi does in his battle plans for defeating the bandits. Because Kambi's group is outnumbered, he's going to use the village as a trap to lure in the bandits and kill them one by one, turning defense into a canny offense. One more point about Iza no Kami, and here we can play six degrees of Kurosawa. What connects Seven Samurai with Kagamusha, Kurosawa's 1980 film about warlord Takara Shingen? These two samurai knew one another and met on the field of battle. Iza no Kami and Takara Shingen fought a prolonged battle over a castle. Shingen won but admired Kami and offered him a job, but Kami preferred to wander and study Zen. So in an alternate universe, we might find Kambei Shimada, the leader of our seven samurai, inside Kagamusha. I really love this shot. This has got to be one of my most favorite shots in Kurosawa. The way that the mother comes out and the choreography of her movement and the way that the lens flattens her gestures. It's just really a striking stylization. Kurosawa now brings in everybody's favorite character, Kikuchio, played with hyperactive exuberance by Toshiro Mifune. Note the oversized sword. Kikuchio wouldn't be overcompensating a bit, would he? Kurosawa uses Shimura and Mifune superbly well, contrasting their respective ages as a statement about maturity and the lack thereof. This exchange of glances is really interesting, Kambei's piercing stare and Kikuchio's inability to meet his gaze. What is Kambei wondering about? Does he think perhaps Kikuchio might make trouble? He sizes him up quickly, though, as he does everyone in every situation in the film, seeing instantly the nature of his character. He gives Kikuchio a last look and then turns to receive the rice balls from the child's mother. In the legend, Iza no Kami rescued the child without violence. Putting his Zen precepts into action, he had perfected methods of taking the enemy's sword away without killing him. During his travels, he spread this philosophy that courage lies in avoiding needless conflicts and its methods of using the sword. Kurosawa, though, knows that showing this wouldn't be as cinematic as what he really wants to do. And besides, he's making a chambara, so he's going to give us violence that isn't in the legend. And the way that he does it is going to change cinema forever. This is no exaggeration, no empty rhetoric. In the scene we're watching now, Kurosawa wrote the textbook on modern movie violence intercutting slow motion and normal speed action in ways that influenced filmmakers forever afterward. Every modern director who does this, John Woo, Sam Peckinpah, and the whole bunch, learned how to do it from Kurosawa. Kambi, uh, like the inspiration from the legend, throws in the rice balls to distract the thief. And he goes inside the hut, and Kurosawa keeps the actual moment of violence off camera by having it occur inside the hut there. And by doing that, he kind of heightens the stylization of the aftermath, namely the intercut shots of the slow motion thief running outside, already mortally wounded. So there he goes, cut to the onlookers. And now we're into film magic. We've got five shots of the thief running in slow motion intercut with the onlookers. Now this slow motion work is actually shot with a, a high speed camera. The film is racing through the camera at sometimes more than 100 frames per second. It just goes whoosh right through the camera. So he's got to use different cameras to capture the different speeds. And the fall here occurs without sound. So there's another little audio flourish there that adds to the magic of the sequence. The thing about slow motion is that it allows the editor to slip into and out of the decelerated moment very quickly as long as you keep it brief. Slow motion ordinarily is a kind of drag on the action, but if you keep the inserts brief, then they derive their energy from the surrounding normal speed footage and the whole assembly becomes extraordinarily tense because of the differing time frames that you see. Kurosawa didn't invent this style. He had used slow motion before in his first film, Sanshiro Sugata. And other filmmakers had done it well before him, like Ziga Vertov in Man with a Movie Camera in 1929. 
Generally, though, these instances involve just dropping one slow motion shot into the body of a normal speed sequence. Interesting, but not exciting. What Kurosawa did here, by contrast, was intercut different camera speeds, creating a tension from disrupting time that's sustained across the body of a sequence. Kurosawa perfected the essential stylistic template of modern movie violence. He showed everyone how to do it and how splendid the results could be. Kurosawa gives us Kambi on the road and introduces a gesture that helps define Kambi uh, throughout the remainder of the film and becomes very endearing. And that's the head rubbing, which he does throughout the movie as his hair grows back. It helps establish the passing of time, but the gesture itself is very typical of Kurosawa. It's something he evidently retrieved from Stray Dog, where Shimura, playing a police detective, first does it. Kurosawa often worked this way, asking his actors to develop a key gesture or vocal inflection repeated throughout a film as a way of defining character. In Yojimbo, of course, Mifune scratches his chest and his head, and in Redbeard, he tugs at his beard. In Kagamusha, Tatsuya Nakadai strokes his chin. In Dersu Uzala, Dersu exclaims, Kapitan, to his friend, a Russian captain. This is something I like to call the camera angle for heroes, a slightly low camera shot that elevates Kambi into the frame, increasing his stature in a really very attractive way. In this moving camera shot, Kambi shows the modesty that Kurosawa finds admirable and is one of the measures of his greatness. He tells Katushiro he's got no disciples, dialogue that resonates with the ethic of equality that Kurosawa explores in the movie in connection with the ethos of post-war Japan. Kambi also tells Katushiro that his experience lies in losing battles. The remark seems ironic because we know that Kambi is great. He's among the greatest of all Kurosawa heroes. But the sentiment evokes the tragic view of history that is at the heart of this film and the melancholy that Kurosawa is going to express so powerfully about the end of the samurai class. Look at this wide-angle shot and the way that Kurosawa just puts that sword right into the camera. And then we've got Katushiro in the mid-ground and the farmers in the very background, everybody in crisp focus. Kurosawa was a master of wide-angle composition, something that tends to be forgotten because of his telephoto work. But look at any of his earlier pictures and you'll find extraordinary compositions like that one. Kurosawa's got Mifune on a very long leash in this film. He created Kikuchio to add a kind of comic quality to the movie that the band of samurai otherwise wouldn't have. And he essentially told Mifune to have fun, to make the character his own, and so Mifune gives us a wonderfully comic performance that makes Kikuchio endearing and also surprises us by finding the tenderness and the tragedy in the character as well. Kikuchio is our point of entry into the film. Kambi is a god, we're awed by him, but his majesty keeps us at a distance. Kikuchio, by contrast, is our stand-in, our representative among these titans. He humanizes the world that Kurosawa puts on screen here, and that's why he's so important and why it was so shrewd of Kurosawa and his screenwriters to realize that they needed a character like this. Now, everything is so lean and tight in this film. Of course, it's Rikichi who makes the approach. He's been doing this with all of the samurai they've offered the deal toward. But Kurosawa just gives us a shot here where he kneels in front of Kambi and a fast wipe and we leap over the proposition itself. We go into a scene where Kambi is now reflecting upon the offer that the farmers have laid at his feet, as it were. There's a nice heroic shot allowing Kambi to rise up into the frame and dominate it with his back. In the dialogue we're now hearing, Katushiro twice calls Kambe sensei, which is sometimes translated as sir, but actually means teacher or master. Katushiro's use of this term indicates that he has, at least in his own mind, formally apprenticed himself to Kambe as a student who will learn from him the ways of weaponry and war. The term formalizes the hierarchy of wisdom and experience that's going to govern their relationship. Kambe here framed alone isolated as an individual, contrasted with the farmers that Kurosawa groups together as a cluster, a unit of suffering humanity. You can see there the difference in the framing. And there's a little comic touch here, Rikichi answering eagerly that yes, those horses can get over the hills. 
not stopping to think that, in fact, what he's just said is a great disadvantage. Kurosawa shows us here how careful a strategist Kambi is. He plots the defense of the village in a way that enables him to calculate how many samurai they will need. So seven isn't an arbitrary number. It's the minimum that can establish a guarded perimeter around the village. And Kambi is already thinking about using the moat as defense. Kurosawa incorporating this historical detail into the story as a samurai battle tactic rather than as a practice among farming villages. Kurosawa loves process. He loves to systematically show the steps by which a goal is accomplished. That's why he's made two superb police procedurals, Stray Dog and High and Low, and he's going to show us very systematically how Kambi sets up the village defense and then wages war on the bandits. Kambi's skill at procedure is a character trait that Kurosawa shared. You see it in the careful construction of his films. And in giving it to Kambi, he's bonding with this character because he's giving Kambi a little bit of himself. So Kambi basically decides it's not his fight. He turns them down and the farmers weep collectively as an expression of their class misery. The true measure of Kurosawa heroes is that they act selflessly on behalf of others who are less fortunate. And Kurosawa gives us, in the end of the scene, one of the most splendid illustrations of the ideal of heroism that you will ever see in any of his films. Kambi's decided he's got no stakes in this struggle. Kurosawa reprises the chorus on the music track to suggest again the elemental nature of the suffering of the peasants. And when one of these ruffians points out that the farmers are giving Kambi rice while eating millet, He's so deeply touched by their gesture that he feels a reciprocal obligation to honor their sacrifice. This is a really interesting camera move here. This pan to the left and a pull back. It's a little hard to identify because you rarely see that kind of move on screen, but it really punches up this bit of business as Katushiro tries to intervene. He's a little bit ineffective. We know he's not going to prevail against the ruffians, but he's got to give it a little shot anyway. And Kurosawa ends the scene with this splendid bit of business as Kambi accepts the job. He takes the rice bowl and extends the bowl toward the farmers in a masterfully framed composition. It's a shot that gives us an emblem of the debt that Kambi feels toward the farmers in a gesture that says, finally, I'm on your side. It's such a beautiful shot. Kurosawa lets this linger for a moment, this expression of nobility and reciprocal debt and obligation. The ruffians had pointed up the contrast between rice and millet, and it's worth saying something about that here because it's played such an important role in the evolution of the scene. It was really not unusual for the farmers to be eating millet. In this period, farmers ate mostly millet rather than rice. Millet was easier to grow. It's a very hardy grain and didn't require as much attention or water, unlike rice that requires a lot of water and very precise temperatures. Millet also keeps very well. It's easy to stockpile and store. Rice was too valuable to serve as a staple of the everyday diet. For one thing, it was harder to cultivate, and for another, it was used as a form of currency by farmers in the period. They paid their land taxes in fixed amounts of rice, and in the film, they are paying the samurai in rice. That's why they've brought it with them to the village and why it's such a disaster when a bad samurai steals the grains from Yohei. It's really a theft of money. Rice then was traditionally a grain that farmers bequeathed to samurai and other nobility, as we see them doing in the scene with Kambi. It was also a sacred grain, possessing spiritual powers. Sprinkling grains of rice on the ground could help purify it and drive out evil spirits, and balls of cooked rice were thought to symbolize the soul. So Kambi's gesture with the rice bowl is profound because it acknowledges all of these contexts in which rice functioned in the Sengoku period. By holding the rice bowl out to the farmers, he's accepting payment for his services, he's acknowledging the formal contract of employment that the rice represents, and he's acknowledging the spiritual bond with the farmers that the rice ball symbolizes. It testifies to Kambi's depth of character that he sees and responds to all of these nuances in his relationship to the farmers. 
And that's why Kurosawa holds the shot for so long, because it is such a charged moment. Now it's time to recruit our other five samurai. Kurosawa and his screenwriters invent so much splendid business in the film, like this scene here that shows us the test that Kambi has devised to assess the character of the various candidates. Like everything in the movie, it's embedded in a rich tapestry of character interplay. There's always a lot to watch going on. Kambi uses the test to decide which samurai to approach, but it also works as a step in Katushiro's education as a samurai, and Kurosawa also spins a little narrative out of Yohei's fearful responses, slinking off each time Katushiro reaches for his stick. And there goes Yohei, slinking behind the, the fence post there. Kurosawa gives us now some very fluid backward tracking shots with our candidate as he approaches. And uh, when he comes inside, look at the way that Kurosawa's lenses take the action and transform it. Here we go, here's a backward tracking shot, cut Katushiro, backward tracking shot, and the telephoto transformation of the action makes it look actually slightly speeded up. A splendid joke there as Katushiro slams into the wall, completely ignored by Kambi, who proclaims it splendid. That our samurai has passed. Such a richly constructed film, a joke nestled inside the action. Conventional movie continuity really doesn't exist for Kurosawa. We're going to get some cross-cutting here that joins flat space telephoto images with deep focus wide angle images. And you can see a radical difference in the perspective of the respective shots. It's going to happen when we come out of this master shot here and go into the, a series of over the shoulder shots back and forth between Kambi and this candidate. There's our telephoto composition. Looks very flat. There's our wide angle composition. One of the things that wide angle does is exaggerate size differences as markers of distance, and telephoto tends to erase those size differences, making everything look about the same. There you can see again. And you can see that Katushira really wasn't that far away from Kambi, but the wide angle lens made it look like he was. Kurosawa's methods of shooting and cutting are quite original. You'd never find this sort of shooting in a Hollywood film of the period. Nobody else would join frames that don't match in this way, but Kurosawa's style is quite angular and aggressive, and much of this effect is achieved through his unconventional choices about camera setups, lenses, and edit points. Kurosawa's theme, again, throughout this scene, has been that most samurai are simply unwilling to help the farmers. This fellow asked Kambi which clan they'd be fighting for, assuming it to be a more traditional kind of employment, and was much too haughty even to consider joining Kambi. So Kurosawa gives us in our seven samurai a group of supreme heroes, but he also suggests that they are atypical samurai, that while they represent the ideal of their class, they don't represent its actual behavior. He gives us here now our first glimpse of one of the film's most memorable landscapes. It's the hill with the uh, graves on top of it. Many of the film's great scenes are going to play out there, especially the ending where Kurosawa uses a camera move to link the surviving samurai with the graves of their fallen comrades atop the hill. More great pans of strutting samurai ending with Garabe there entering the frame. There's no obvious indication about why Kambi chooses him, and that's important because it suggests that Kambi, like a Zen master, can see instantly into the heart of things. He knows immediately that Garabe will be worth interviewing. A similar moment happens a bit later when he and Katushiro watch Kyuzo's duel with a blustering opponent. Kambi watches only Kyuzo while Katushiro's gaze wanders back and forth between the two. We get a little reprise now of our subplots of Katushiro being educated in the ways of the warrior and Yohei being uh, <laughs> given a chance to show what a coward he is. Garabe is played by Yoshio Inaba, who never became a regular player in Kurosawa's work. Their relations on the film, in fact, were a bit tense, and maybe that's why Kurosawa didn't use him again. But his instincts in casting Inaba were right. Inaba projects such a strong sense of solidity and decency that we immediately understand why Kambi wants him. Look, for example, at his reaction to the trick that he sniffs out. Instead of becoming insulted, he laughs good-naturedly. He's strong and secure enough not to feel threatened by Kambi's ruse. 
Kambi fascinates him because he's leading this most unusual venture. And Gorobe prophecies that a great friendship is going to develop from their association. Kurosawa doesn't foreground the friendship or give it much screen time, but it's there as part of the epic tapestry of the film. We've got a three and a half hour film, but it doesn't feel that way. The rhythms are that of a shorter film. But at the same time, he takes time out for texture and atmosphere, and that's what makes it such a rich historical picture. And now I'd like to hand things off to my friend David Desser, who will continue the commentary. David is a great scholar of Japanese film and Kurosawa, and he's also known as the Eighth Samurai. Hi, I'm David Desser, and I'll be picking up the story from here. In the next 40 minutes, we will see encapsulated so many of the things that make Kurosawa one of the most, if not arguably the most influential director of all time, and Seven Samurai, one of the greatest, if not the greatest film of all time. Kurosawa can move from high drama to low comedy, from laughter to tears, from stillness to dynamism. He will have complex, long takes, dynamic editing. He will show men in battle, men bonding, samurai learning something of the life of farmers and vice versa. In other words, thematically and stylistically, Kurosawa is a master at showing all of the possibilities for films and all the possibility for drama. So let's start with this brief scene that is typical of Kurosawa's strategy throughout this whole section, and that is to begin right in the middle of things, to eliminate either the beginning or the end. The what's wrong asked by Rikichi comes out of nowhere, so to speak, because we haven't seen anything wrong, because we haven't seen Yohei yet. And when we do see him, he is even more low-key and forlorn than usual. And now we know why. Of course, losing the rice is a tragedy. We have already seen what rice means. Yohei will soon pick up the rice one grain at a time. And this might therefore have more resonance than just the farmer's pathos in the film. I suspect an audience in 1954 Japan can well remember a time when rice and much else was in short supply. But we know what rice means by now, and so the point of this scene is not just to reiterate this fact, though Kurosawa will remind his audience from time to time just what is at stake at every step of the way. This scene is really about Katsushiro, not only to show that he is perhaps more well-to-do than his samurai elders, as we see him toss a few moan down to the floor, but this will also show him taking some concrete action on the farmer's behalf, showing his sympathies for their plight. And he does so in a quiet, mature fashion, needing to say nothing and to have nothing said in return. In this introduction of Shichiroji, Kurosawa again leaves out some possibly important things, such as where and how did Kambei run into his old buddy, and the immediate shock and surprise of recognition. Instead, here they are. More interestingly, Kurosawa leaves out most of the backstory of their relationship and the battle that separated them. They talk only briefly about the fight that occurred in the past, Kurosawa feeling no compulsion to fill the audience in on the intriguing details. A burning castle, hiding in a ditch, the relief of being alive. Instead, Shichirochi expresses a kind of casual bravado. With a glance at the farmers, Kambei allows his old friend a chance to prove his bravery and his mettle once again. A bit of foreshadowing occurs at the end of this sequence for Kambei's idea that perhaps we die this time, which only brings a smile to Shichiroji's face, actually finds the two of them and Katsushiro, and they are alone among the samurai in this scene, and they are alone among the samurai who do not die this time. As Gorobe goes to see this perhaps second-rate samurai, but first-rate woodchopper, Kurosawa films the encounter in a single long take that begins as a follow shot until the two are in the frame, and then the camera remains static for some amusing byplay. His recruit will be Heihachi. Heihachi is given something like a star entrance. He's talked about before we see him, and then we hear his off-screen kiai, his lusty shout as he brings down the axe. You know, sometimes we forget that film is as much 
oral as it is visual. And Kurosawa really makes us pay attention not just to what he's showing us, but also to what we may be able to hear. And so this oral introduction really engages us in ways that are beyond the visual. The shot itself lasts 50 seconds, fairly long, but hardly the longest in the film. The amusing bit of business is when Heihachi moves his sword away from the stranger. What Kurosawa is interested in here is the first of the two Zen-like swordsmen he will introduce. Men who manifest, that is, attitudes typical of Zen Buddhism. Heihachi reflects the humor and playfulness of Zen and the attitude of giving it all you've got in every pursuit. He also reflects Zen-like practicality. The long take ends with Heihachi's claim that he's better at killing his enemies than chopping wood. Yet he undercuts his own bravado by acknowledging that he can't kill them all, so he runs away when there's too many. Funny, practical, and self-effacing, he is the Zen master as wise fool. Yet he's not foolhardy. Gorobe's invitation to join the soon-to-be seven samurai is filmed from the rear precisely to get the most out of Heihachi's comically shocked reaction to killing 30 bandits. If Heihachi is the Zen master as clown, Kurosawa immediately takes us to the second of his Zen swordsman, Kyuzo. Once again, we start in the middle of a scene, as the crowd is already gathered to watch a duel. The staging of this duel is quite interesting. The men stand opposite each other. And then when the pretend swords are ready, Kyuzo's opponent walks toward the camera off right, and Kyuzo walks off left. The next shot seems to be something like a jump cut, but in fact the men face each other in the same left to right orientation. They have essentially circled around each other. The point of moving them like this is to get the crowd in the background. As we will see, Kurosawa allows the men to change places in the frame, but he does so, unlike when Ozu does this, because of point of view shots. Kyuzo's on the right, his opponent on the left, but when we see Kambe watching, they have switched their orientation. Now the opponent faces left. Return to Kambe, Kyuzo faces right. With this point of view orientation in place, Kurosawa can repeat this new change screen direction. The opponent facing left, Kyuzo facing right, intercut with Kambe's point of view. I think Kurosawa's trick, so to speak, with screen space and mismatched action is done not the same way Ozu does it. I really think Kurosawa has in mind not so much visual acrobatics or even to confuse the audience, but actually to insist on point of view. In the long shot, where the characters are oriented in one direction, we have the crowd in the background. In the point of view, they're reversed, because he's moved the camera on the other side of the area. But he really wants to insist on point of view, and so that when he goes back to the longer shot, we again want to see the crowd watching. But when we get these point of view shots, we really need to see them looking. And Kurosawa is perfectly willing to flip them in the frame in order to insist on the importance of vision and looking and point of view. It is indeed the case that Kambe sees more clearly than we do. For when the opponent challenges Kyuzo to a fight with real swords, Kambe knows, in a way that Katsushiro may not, who will obviously be the winner. Of course, we may intuit that from Kyuzo's cat-like quickness that he will win. This is quite a feat of acting from Seiji Miyaguchi, who had never appeared in a samurai film previously, and who would, over the course of a rather minor film career, not really do so again. When the man challenges Kyuzo to a real fight, we notice that Kurosawa puts the crowd in the background again. I like to call Kurosawa's propensity for using characters who watch other characters within the frame something like the internal chorus. Like the chorus of Greek drama, they implicitly or explicitly comment on the action and mirror our own responses. Here in specific, it will be Katsushiro who mirrors our own response. While Kambe knows the outcome of the duel, Katsushiro may or may not, but his eyes glimmer in anticipation of the impending fight. Kurosawa then does the same game with screen direction. The opponent faces left, crowd in the background, jump cut moves us closer to the crowd, but then notice that the opponent delivers his battle cry, he's facing the wrong direction. But why? 
to let Kambe and Katsushiro experience the killing from their point of view, which is to say our point of view. And the famous slow-motion death of the opponent is the dramatic and psychological time, not of the dying man, but of the people watching. That close-up of Katsushiro confirms this. A patented Kurosawa wipe takes us back into town, where we soon realize that Kurosawa has performed another elision. Asked by Gorobe if he found any samurai, Kambai answers that he missed one. And as a crowd rushes by to investigate what we've just witnessed, we realize that Kurosawa has elided the very conversation where Kambei asked Kyuzo to join the group. Of course, it is important that Kambei note that he told Kyuzo where to come if he changes his mind. Interestingly, just as we never see Kambei enlist Kyuzo, we never see the moment that Kyuzo changes his mind. We are left wondering for ourselves, along with the other clues that Kurosawa provides. Yet what makes a man decide such a thing after all? Kurosawa, as he so memorably did in Rashomon, sometimes leaves things for his audience to decide. Again, it's interesting that Gorobe and not Shichiroji has become Kambei's lieutenant. Though the latter was an old comrade, Kambei is a good judge of character, and we will see how much he comes to rely on Gorobe's wisdom. Gorobe's notion that Heihachi is a second-class swordsman but a first-class character is borne out by the latter's humorous self-introduction. He gives his family name, his given name, and the sword-fighting style which he studied. <laughs> Samurai trained in specific styles, but the woodcut school was not among them, of course. Yet another wipe takes us to the next scene, and one is intrigued, if puzzled, by the Bunraku-style doll operator in the background. This might be a bit of an anachronism. The puppet theater wasn't established until a bit later in Japanese history, although I'll allow Kurosawa and his screenwriters greater knowledge than I possess on this score. It's an interesting throwaway. Most decidedly not a throwaway, of course, is the reintroduction of Toshiro Mifune, who shows up in a moment. In the meanwhile, I'm struck in this bit about Kambei's refusal to take Katsushiro along by the depth of insight on the part of the farmers. Of course, Kambei is sensitive to the young man and wants to warn him against the pipe dreams of youth, of wasting his life in a hopeless quest for fame, fortune, or position. Kurosawa's cut back to the longer shot shows us that all the samurai can sympathize with broken dreams and passing years. But their reverie is interrupted when Heihachi sees something off-screen, and an over-the-shoulder shot reveals that Kyuzo has made an appearance. An interesting close-up of Kyuzo makes us wonder how much he has overheard. Does he feel the same way? And is that something of why he has decided to join the group? One of those clues to his character whose ultimate meaning we must decide for ourselves. And now we see once again how much of a boy Katsushiro still is. He can barely hold back his tears. Rikichi looks at Yohei here. These men, mature and wise in their own way, understand what it means to the youngster and they may very well recall his kindness and sensitivity toward them earlier in the day. Heihachi begins to show something of his understanding of human nature, too, and he will be the most talkative and often the most perceptive about hidden motivations. When the older samurai decide to count Katsushiro among the group, Heihachi then points out Kyuzo's arrival, knowing that the quiet samurai has come to join the group. Yeah. Kambei's decision to leave tomorrow and sacrifice the seventh samurai may take us initially by surprise, but not really, for after all, the film is called Seven Samurai, and we haven't seen Toshiro Mifune again. Though Mifune was not quite the major star he would soon become, he was already a rising star in the Japanese cinema, and of course a Kurosawa favorite already the caged tiger to Takashi Shimura's majestic lion. 
Of course, we don't have to wait long, as one of the porters announces that he has found a samurai for them. <laughs> this close-up of the porter, I think, derives right from the Kabuki theater. He is a comic character, and I think this establishes the comic tone of this sequence of Kikuchio, who will similarly get a kind of large Kabuki-esque close-up. And also the porter is a kind of chorus once again. He stands in for us, so he's like an announcer. It's as if someone has come into the frame and said, hear ye, hear ye, but in a very funny way. With Katsushido back in the fold, Kanbei allows him to do his samurai test once more. And we cringe in anticipation of the inevitable crashing failure to come. The drunken porter is something of our stand-in here. He questions the fairness of this test so that we too may learn what Kanbei insists, that a good samurai will dodge it and that a good samurai would never get so drunk. And sure enough, Mifune fails completely. Kurosawa treats it comically by cutting to the face of the porter and that off-screen thwack. And then the extreme close-up to show us Kikuchio's less-than-triumphant entrance, but Mifune's long-awaited reappearance. <laughs> I find the makeup here rather extreme. In fact, it looks closer to how Mifune was characterized in Throne of Blood a couple of years later. But perhaps it is in keeping with his larger-than-life exuberance and energy to have him look so thoroughly out of sorts. The close-up on Kanbei allows us to see that he recognizes the wild young man of earlier, while Katsushiro only knows to get out of this man's way. The comic tone of the scene already established by the clunk on the head continues in the farcical efforts of the inebriated Kikuchio's ineffectual chase. This is the first of three long takes that Kurosawa relies on in the sequence. The real point is to bring Kanbei and the other samurai back into frame. From this point on for a while, Kurosawa keeps the camera at the Ozu-like low level for Kikuchio's confrontation with Kanbei and the delivering of the scroll proving his lineage. We can appreciate this low-level shot and the willingness of Kurosawa to use longer takes when the camera assumes a position behind Kambei's head and lets Kikuchio carry on all the movement in the frame. Kambei is the essence of stillness. Even when Kikuchio backs away from Kambei and stands up, the camera reframes only slightly, allowing Kikuchio to loom large in the background. A short insert of the rest of the samurai laughing is followed by a longish medium shot of Mifune to show off a bit more as the camera watches his drunken musings and his efforts to find the scroll. But this is also one part of the Mifune persona. He had so much more energy and so much more liveliness that in many ways he helped redefine acting in the Japanese cinema. He's such a good actor that even one year later, he could play a man 40 years older than himself and totally different kind of performance. And then there follows the most interesting long take of the whole scene. For what Kurosawa will do is to make or allow the audience to pay attention to multiple actions. In this single shot of slightly over one minute, we watch the interaction between Kambei and Kikuchio. We also see Heihachi clearly over his shoulder, and he will count in a way that Kambei does more quickly. But also watch on the left for Kyuzo, who is poised cat-like once again to react. <laughs> When Kanbei reads out the rain year in which he was allegedly born, Heihachi has to figure things out, but Kanbei's a little faster. But Kyuzo's expression changes, and watch when he moves his own sword from his right hand to his left. He leans forward, moves the sword, and he watches Kikuchio, and then grabs the sword before the young man can. And then the farce is on again as Kikuchio, getting more frustrated and ever more tired, becomes the object of a game of keep-away played by the samurai at his expense. 
that it is Heihachi who instigates the game, good-naturedly taunting the young man, is notable. The continuation of the development of his character as the most lively of the actual samurai, and the one in some ways the most humanly and humanely connected to Kikuchio and the farmers, even including Katsushiro. Again and again, Heihachi and Kikuchio. It is from here on in that Kurosawa will build on this connection. And there is something very telling, both in terms of his character, but also the film's theme. When Kikuchio, frustrated by the samurai's game, mutters under his breath, to hell with samurai. This comment not only begins to talk about Kikuchio's origins, but really it's the samurai, both the good and the bad, that have necessitated the whole problem with the farmers. And if there were no such thing as samurai, there might not be these kinds of issues. So Kurosawa, who was, of course, himself from a samurai background, is really making an interesting comment about class divisions in Japanese culture, about power and the powerless, about warriors in times of war and in times of peace. It's just a very, very loaded comment that I think we really should think about. <laughs> <laughs> Another wipe, and the journey to the farming village begins. The wipe is moved right to left. The wipe is, of course, simply a dissolve, but Kurosawa adds an obvious line or edge, and thus this transition is called a hard-edged wipe. It usually moves left to right, the way we in the West read, so it's almost like turning a page. Traditionally, of course, the Japanese read right to left, so Kurosawa can easily switch the directions of his wipes, since the Japanese read both in traditional style and Western style, depending on the work. And so, as Rikichi and Yohei lead the way, the six samurai take up the rear. Here, Kurosawa cuts ahead to the village. The high-angle long shot is typical of how the village is imaged. We see it in this fashion in the first scene as the bandits look down upon it. It seems both bucolic and strangely vulnerable, but this pattern of visual echoes is very important because in terms of repetition, we also have to appreciate difference. First time we saw the village, it was under attack by the brigands. Second time we see it, the farmer is returning home. Third time we see it, the samurai are coming. Similarity, difference, repetition, and difference. It's a very important strategy. With the shot of Shino washing her hair, Kurosawa has a little fun with us by postponing the dramatic point of the scene. By cross-cutting between her and Manzu, it takes both her and us a moment to realize something is amiss. Manzu gives her a weird look, and both she and we remain puzzled. Where is this scene going? But then out comes the razor. Both Shino and the audience remain a bit puzzled at the notion that she has to cut her hair and dress like a boy. But the full import of why she must be shorn of her feminine beauty perhaps remains a puzzlement for a few moments longer yet. And when the truth comes out, Manzo is afraid of the samurai, of who they might be and what they might do to her. This era in Japanese history is an era of great social chaos. Now, the idea normally that a samurai might marry a farmer's daughter would have been very difficult to imagine, but the idea that samurai raping or otherwise pillaging uh, certainly would not have been untoward. And so Manzo has a very good point. We see later on that the brigands have in fact stolen women and that there's nothing to say that these samurai are going to be any different. And Kurosawa's point really is what happens to individual morality precisely in an era of social chaos. But it's telling, too, for although the villagers watch the show, so to speak, they, too, become equally concerned. And indeed, as we will see, when the samurai arrive in the village, there is no one that will come out to greet them. So begins Kurosawa's subtle critique of what power does to the powerless. This idea that neither group is all good or all bad, kind or cruel, weak or strong, is why I think Kurosawa intercuts the scene of the samurai making their way to the village with the scene of the village itself. Kurosawa could just as easily have shown the samurai's trek to the village in one scene, and then showed the scene of the villagers' panic as they await their arrival. 
Instead, we see the samurai make for the village. Then we see Manzo's panic and the rest of the village's response. And then we cut back to the samurai on their way. A much more dynamic way to show the journey to an arrival in the village. And they will show that this journey of the samurai is as fraught with peril as the return of the brigands. And of course, Kurosawa is not unaware of the irony that for all of Manzo's efforts to protect his daughter, to transform her into a boy, she is the one who will be in any case involved with the samurai. The largely comic association that Kikuchio thus far brings with him continue in this interlude of him following the group. And so too does the continued association between Kikuchio and Heihachi. Heihachi is the Zen clown, as I have claimed, Kikuchio merely a clown, at least so far. So the two seemingly comic characters see kindred spirits in the other. It is their deaths that will affect us the most. That is all in the future. Watch here how Kurosawa continues to play with point of view and people looking. Heihachi points, and instead of a POV, Kurosawa cuts, gives us a bump back, and up through the frame comes Mifune. But Kurosawa isn't finished with his playfulness, for he then continues the shot for a while longer, moving Kikuchio away from the samurai in the background and following him as he enters calmer waters. And once again, Kurosawa utilizes the internal chorus, this time making the samurai, who have been the objects of our vision, into the chorus themselves as they watch Kikuchio. I think what Kurosawa does in a scene like this is actually to let us watch people watching. There are all these levels of watching, and by playing with point of view, by not cutting from Heihachi to seeing what he's seeing, but from bumping us back to see Heihachi seeing, and then we see what he sees, a visualization. And that film is not necessarily always susceptible just to narrative, but sometimes there's a playfulness and a way of highlighting something. But this playfulness does have a point, and that is Kurosawa is interested literally sometimes in vision. What is it that we are seeing and what does it mean? People watching other people. So there's kind of three different things going on in a scene like this. And I think that Kurosawa is really very careful to just highlight the multiple ways in which a film unreels at any given moment. It really is just a way to talk about different things at the same time. <laughs> As Rikichi reaches the outskirts of the village, we again see the high-angle long shot, and the rest of the group enters the frame. Exactly, if less ominously, we may think, as the brigands did in the first scene. Clearly, Kikuchio's comment about dying in such a dung heap seems obviously foreshadowing, but neither should we fail to note that it is Heihachi who offers the retort that no one is asking him to. Kurosawa is too good of a director to have the obvious foreshadowing be the main point here. Instead, it is the ongoing relationship between Kikuchio and Heihachi. You know, there's another way in which we can imagine this film, and that is it's seven samurai, but also three farmers, and that Manzo and Yohei and Rikichi are no less important than the samurai in some ways. And it would be a lesser film if the samurai were the only ones that got characterization. If he's really interested in talking about power and powerlessness, it wouldn't be right just to have the powerful be characterized. So too, I think the powerless, so to speak, also need to have some characterization. And Rikichi is a particularly interesting character because in some ways he's the one that's been most affected. His wife has been kidnapped. When he sees his wife later in the film, she'll die. And so he's really the character that brings a lot of the farmer's plight home and in a memorable way. <laughs> Kikuchio's continued laughter may mean he knows what is going on, that the samurai, expecting some sort of hospitality, are met only with silence and absence. Kikuchio has the upper hand now. He's at home, even if it may be only a dung heap. I think it's at this point that Mifune's performance begins to come together that his inner character shows through and prepares us for his real tour de force in a moment. <laughs> Heihachi's sarcasm and Kikuchio's continued laughter aside, notice in a moment that when the samurai head off to the patriarch's house, 
Kikuchio does not follow. <laughs> the left to right hard edged wipe takes us to the granddad's place. The lingering close up on the old man transforms into a complex dolly and pan. It's a camera movement worthy of Orson Welles or Alfred Hitchcock and travels 270 degrees around the old man in order to put him in left profile in the foreground. Kambe now in the middle ground and Heihachi and Shichiroji in the background. But the interesting camera positioning does not stop here. For notice in the next shot that Kurosawa dollies back from a shot of the rest of the samurai. Gorobe in the foreground, Kyuzo and Katsushiro in the background. And now we get a right profile shot of the old man. To cap this off, Kurosawa has dissected the space just as Ozu does and continues with a point of view shot of the cowed farmers. This is followed by another bit of humorous business with camera placement and dollying, as the move back from them gives us a shot of the old man from yet a different vantage point in the room. Kambe, we notice, still sits on the old man's right, exactly where he was the first time we saw him, but from this angle, we cannot see Heihachi and Shichiroji. In this section where we wait for something to happen, Kurosawa substitutes playful camera movement and placement for more obvious drama. Actually, what the old man says is rather didactic, part of a tendency in all of East Asian cinema to make explicit the educational or dramatic point the film wants to make. It's no less powerful for being expressed so directly. Kurosawa does not want us to think less of the farmers. And though he will dramatize their plight, he also makes it explicit. Kambe, of course, is too much of a hero, too much of a genuinely good man to understand their fear of him. With the sudden ringing of the alarm, we see something typical of Kurosawa. He moves from a scene of stillness to one of great dynamism. And this will move us into something we've all been waiting for, the classic Kurosawa montage in the form of running jump cuts, fast pans, dollies, characters running, Kyuzo, Heihachi, Shichiroji, Gorobe, Kambe, and Katsushiro. Kurosawa has been doing this sort of thing since Rashomon, and he does it as late as Rhapsody in August. So we saw all six samurai running, but where is Kikuchio? Ringing the alarm bell, of course. But before we quite have that confirmed, Kambe reveals his leadership skills and his warrior sensibility. He wants calm, and more importantly, he wants to know from which direction the bandits are coming. He's already scoped out the terrain, the mountains behind them, the road in front. Later, of course, he will map all this out. But for now, he's already revealing the planning and forethought that will save the village. One thing I think is that we sometimes may forget that Takashi Shimura is actually the star and that Kambe is a unique character. A true samurai should be able to do the kinds of things he does, but I think Kurosawa's point is that they can't. That Kambe's leadership skills and his warrior sensibilities are unique when they should necessarily not be. And that Kambe has become characterized precisely as a kind of leader at a time when leaders are not as common as they should be. With the revelation that it's been Kikuchio who's been sounding the alarm, it is here that the attentive viewer will realize that he is really a village boy, a farmer's son. Of course, we knew all along that he wasn't a samurai, that his name, in fact, isn't even Kikuchio. But his knowledge of village life, his boisterousness and playfulness here, can barely disguise his fury and I think that accounts for the energy in this scene. It's more than broad comedy. His mercurial movement from laughter to derision speaks volumes of his hatred for both farmer and samurai, and for his own space in between them. And once again, notice that it is Heihachi who receives the close-up at the climax of this scene, that special bond between the two clowns, and it is Heihachi who declares that they are seven. <laughs> this is the most unusual scene in the film because it is the shortest. But it has one major dramatic point to make, and also a lesser one. The first point is to foreshadow the issue of Rikichi's wife, an extremely important point. 
Notice first the vehemence with which Rikichi exclaims that his horses were stolen by bandits. Either he was extremely attached to them, or he has something else in mind. And indeed, of course, more than horses were stolen by the bandits. What that something else might have been is clearly indicated in the next moment when we see Kikuchio putting on a woman's kimono. Rikichi's exclamation that, I have no wife, hardly needs glossing. But Kikuchio's muttering comment that Rikichi is crazy puts a momentary comic spin on things, although the rest of the samurai are a bit more concerned. But that moment is deflated further, of course, by Heihachi, who finally tags Mifune's character with the name by which we have been calling him all along. And is there some foreshadowing in Mifune's mysterious background, in his forgetting his real name, that looks to Yojimbo and Sanjuro, also men with no names? Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I think Kurosawa is interested in doing with so many of his films is to talk about and show what I like to call process, how things get done. There's an almost documentary-like flavor to this whole sequence with the map and the roads and the training. For instance, how would one go about defending a village? First, Kambe draws a map of the terrain, and then he engages his second-in-command, Gorobe, in discussions of how to defend it by thinking of how they might attack it. Notice, too, the presence of Katsushiro. His education is starting in earnest. But this map and the plan of defense are not handled casually. It is almost as if we could ourselves reconstruct the village and could defend it, too. We'll soon see the training sequences of the farmers and the digging of ditches and the erecting of barriers. I like the way that we see the map directions and then move to that very geographical locale. And we see how Shichiroji has enlisted the farmers in making logs for a fence, and how Gorobe and Kambe have faith and confidence in Shichiroji's knowledge. There is also, therefore, something about professionalism that begins to come through here. This question of trust and professionalism in men doing their jobs well, trusting the professionalism of the rest of the group, is partly what I think the movie is about from this point on. We actually hadn't seen that much of Shichiroji. Here we get a chance to get some of the natural good humor and good spirits that make actor Daisuke Kato another Kurosawa favorite. If the West showed us Shichiroji, South will show us Kyuzo. We come to see that each of the remaining samurai is given specific duties. Katsushiro has no fighting skills or combat training, and so then there would be little he could teach the farmers about the ways of war. But he can certainly learn something of planning and thinking from Kambe and Gorobe too. And Gorobe realizes something that we may have forgotten in the excitement of the whole movie, that, in fact, the bandits may attack before they're ready, and indeed they do. There are always surprises in warfare. Someone else who can teach us a good deal about fighting is, of course, Kyuzo. Katsushiro's attraction to Kyuzo is nicely shown in this section, as the young man can't seem to keep his eyes off the older swordsman as he teaches the farmers how to use spears. Notice how he turns back to watch, as the cat-like Kyuzo easily dodges the farmer's blow. <laughs> In any case, West and South have been covered, so they move on to the East. With the idea that some houses will have to be evacuated, along with the mill, will come a very interesting idea later on, and a very seemingly conservative one that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. In fact, this film about a group of samurai is in some ways closer in spirit to that most traditional of samurai stories, 
the loyal 47 Ronin, than it is to the more anarchic features of the 1920s and 30s, and to the later films of the 1960s. Kurosawa may be just a bit more conservative after all than his Western admirers and the cliché that he is the most Western of Japanese directors might indicate. Again, we will see that Kurosawa makes a clear link between Heihachi and Kikuchio. For from the scene of Heihachi instructing the farmers, we will then see Kikuchio with his charges. In both men we see he use humor to teach. Notice too that Kurosawa has moved, so to speak, from Kyuzo to Heihachi to Kikuchio, the three men who will attack the bandit fortress. Kurosawa is always giving us information and foreshadowing in a variety of ways. Of course, it is important to note that Kikuchio is now a full-fledged member of the group, one of the seven samurai, and that he too is entrusted with teaching. Of course, he is a bit more individualistic than the other samurai, his teaching methods a bit more unorthodox. And again we notice both his facility with the farmers and his derision of them. Kurosawa couldn't be clearer regarding Kikuchio's inner turmoil. There is also his particular attraction for children. If Katsushiro is boyish, Kikuchio is childlike. The children come running over to see him teach. There are no other children around the rest of the samurai. And in making fun of Yohei, amidst all the serious training and preparations, the laughter of children is a breath of fresh air. I think the childlike qualities that he has that attract this group of children is more than simply comedy. There's an innocence about him, a joie de vivre, and it's exactly why we feel his death later on, I think, as much as anyone's, because he's really, despite everything, basically innocent. And that's a very important point in terms of Kurosawa's discussion of what happens to the powerless when they confront power. It's that very innocence that we love so much that will later on be destroyed. One of the main points in this section, I think, has really been to establish the relationships between the samurai and also between the samurai and the farmers. It's from this point on, I think, the film really has a narrative drive. There's a little bit less of the illusions, a little bit less of the playfulness. Now it's a time to see the men responding to each other, planning the battle, taking the battle to them, but the film has established itself, and from this point on, I think its narrative drive is clear. The themes have been in place. This is a film about men in battle, men who learn something about the problems and needs of others. Some die, some don't, but we're really left with characters that we will remember forever. Hi, I'm Tony Raines, and it falls to me at this rather unlikely point in the film to take over the commentary. Unlikely because we're kind of in the middle of a scene. Kambe and the others are still reconnoitering the village and starting to plan their defences with this map that we have on screen right now. This is a scene that began, of course, some time ago, and it reaches its climax shortly. Our focus here, though, is on the samurai who strays from the project in hand, young Katsushiro, picks a sprig of flowers, and we're going to focus in the coming moments on his encounter, his first encounter with the village girl Shino, uh, who is disguised as a boy, precisely to protect her from the marauding attentions of samurai like Katsushiro. It's a rather ironic episode in the film, in a sense, because this is predominantly a homosocial film. It's filmed centrally about relations between men. And this teen romance element that is one of the many strands that runs through the film is, on the face of it, somewhat anomalous. But actually, the section of the film I'm going to talk about is sort of bookended by this scene and another scene between Katsushiro and Shino. And I think in the transition from this rather innocent beginning to uh, a somewhat less innocent ending, which will come up in, I don't know, about 40 minutes, we will find some interesting clues to what is actually going on in this film and what are the underlying thoughts of Kurosawa when he made it.
The film is, in my view, predominantly a film about what makes a samurai. It's some kind of redefinition of warrior identity. And we'll come to some larger questions about Kurosawa's relationship to the Jidai Geki tradition in Japan, that's to say the period film tradition in Japan, and why this uh, education sentimentale, if we can call it that, of this young man, who is obviously virgin at this point, should be an important part of that redefinition. Katsushiro assumes at first glance that she is a girl, and of course he's proved right. And the demonstration of that in the following moments of the film is pretty self-explanatory, I think. So maybe we'll take this moment to just note in passing the extraordinary influence that uh, Kurosawa's films of this period had on the development of Chinese martial arts films, which have had so much attention in recent years, thanks to films like Hero and such. The influence here, I think, is more directly on a filmmaker like King Hu, the director of films like Dragon Gate Inn and Touch of Zen and such. Part of it is is the planning. The, we saw Kanbei making his map of the village and discussing strategy. That's a motif that feeds directly into most King Hu films. But uh, equally, this notion of a, a girl disguised as a boy connects with a Chinese tradition which King Hu exploited. Most of the women disguised as men in King Hu films are in the Mulan tradition. They're female warriors who are de-feminized women, virilized women, you can say. But there's also an element of sexual play in King Hu films, which I think picks up on what's going on here. Given that the film's context is predominantly a homosocial one, it's of course ironic that Katsushiro's initiation should be at the hands of a young woman who is disguising herself as a boy. It gives us uh, a very interesting sexual subtext. Now, as far as I know, Kurosawa never discussed his output in the kind of terms that Graham Greene used to describe his novels, which he divided into the categories of literature and entertainments. But in Kurosawa's terms, this film clearly is an entertainment. It's an action adventure with a lot of comedy and indeed action and adventure in it. And it comes after, let's not forget, three pretty serious heavy films. He'd made Rashomon, which is his first attempt at reinventing the Jidai Geki form. He then made Takuchi, The Idiot, his adaptation from Dostoevsky, which I guess was for many years his most experimental film. And Ikiru, uh, Living, a film about dying, of course, which breached a very fundamental Japanese taboo in place at the time and still largely in place now against even discussing cancer. So this, by comparison, is a fairly lightweight film. But lightweight does not mean not serious, just as it didn't mean that in Graham Greene's case when he wrote entertainment novels. And this particular scene, in which uh, Kikuchio brings this load of pillaged samurai armor in, as if he's uh, made a great achievement, brings one of those serious themes to a head. As I've said, I think the film is largely about what it takes to be a real samurai. It's not a matter of form or behavior, it's a matter of spirit and attitude. And this presentation of a great load of pillaged armor to a group of genuine samurai, which offends them deeply, of course, raises the issue of whether Kikuchio can ever really be a samurai, behaving and doing such things. Their reaction, in turn, provokes his most florid, most heartfelt speech of the entire film. That's something of a set piece in the film, and it's, it's of course, much quoted and much anthologized. And I think it provides us with a, a moment to reflect on Kurosawa's own input into this film at a very personal level. Anybody who's read Kurosawa's autobiographical notes, they're published in a book called Something Like an Autobiography, knows that this book is full of disavowals and disclaimers. He's constantly saying that he doesn't feel he can be honest enough about himself to tell the truth. He'll exaggerate his good side, he'll minimize his faults, and it'll all be very misleading. And it's for that reason, he says, that the book ends in 1950 with the making of Rashomon. And if you have read the book, you'll know that it concludes with a recommendation that anybody who wants to know more about Kurosawa himself in the years since Rashomon should look at the characters in his films. He says, that's where you'll find me. That's where you'll find the truth about me. Well, my hazard here is that one fundamental truth about Kurosawa is present in Kikuchiyo's speech. This very embittered speech about the sad fate of farmers, how venal, how uh, unscrupulous, how dishonest they are, and how indeed they pillage samurai armor and attack samurai and such. 
But then he goes on to point out that the farmers have become like that not because of some innate ill nature or bad nature or bad character, but because samurai themselves have made them like that. This is what reveals to Kanbei, the very wise and almost saintly Kanbei, that Kikuchio himself is clearly not a samurai, but in fact is a farmer's son. He comes from the other side of the tracks, as it were. Kurosawa's own position in this film is probably quite analogous to Kikuchio's. He doesn't identify 100% with the samurai or indeed with the farmers, but somewhere in between, which is, of course, precisely Kikuchio's position. And in fact, on autobiographical note, since we've touched on this, Kikuchio has already been, for fans of Kurosawa, identified with the author because we've seen him catching a fish with his bare hands. And if we read the autobiography, we discover that that's one of the things that young Kurosawa did in real life. So that element in the film is an autobiographical reminiscence. It doesn't mean that Kikuchio represents Kurosawa all the way through the film. He certainly doesn't. In fact, the, the film is quite critical, of course, in many ways of Kikuchio's character. But we also shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this comes in the middle of a very long collaboration between this director and this actor. Probably the most sustained thing of its kind in cinema since the long collaboration between Joseph von Sternberg and Marlene Dietrich. <laughs> The position that Kikuchio has just expressed, the critique, if you like, of the relationship between peasants and samurai in 16th century Japan, is an anachronism in the film. It's one of a set of anachronisms that runs all the way through the film, in the sense that nobody in the 16th century would have actually analyzed the social situation in those terms. It's a modern perspective, and I think, as I've suggested, Kurosawa's perspective. These shots, incidentally, of uh, Kikuchio's back as he sobs and his feet as he runs out are uh, almost Bressonian, actually, and it demonstrates in a very smart way, I think, how Kurosawa is becoming very confident about using something other than facial expressions to articulate emotion. He's also, as you can see from this composition, when the village elder arrives to check that everything is okay, becoming very confident about using a certain kind of dynamic composition. You'll remember that the film began with credits that were skewed, nothing was full square. And that kind of diagonal composition of faces, heads, is very typical of the film. There are many, many shots like the one we've just seen. This encounter on the village street outside between Katsushiro with his uh, hormones surging and Kikuchio, who is in this disgruntled mode, having been told off and having given vent to his feelings, is I think very typical of another strategy in the film where you get different strands of subplot that intersect and they're apparent mismatches at all times. You have uh, one happy character, one sad or un upset character encountering each other. Kikuchio's disgruntlement, of course, is offset by his association with the kids, as usual. We've already seen this many times in the film. And that combination of things, I think, turns out to be crucial to Kurosawa's strategy in this building of a new image of what the samurai truly is. But I think it's the clash that interests us at this moment. It's the fact that things don't seem to fit together, that the film is constantly changing gear, as it were. And this scene in the barn or the stable outside Rikichi's house is another aspect of it. For the night after this confrontation with the rest of the samurai group, Kikuchio has opted to spend the night in the stable with their host. They've been billeted in his house, of course, because he has no wife, which turns out in turn to be an important plot point. But what's interesting here is that Kikuchio has opted not to be a samurai for tonight, but to join the farmers and sleep in the barn. And this is an extension of the film's anachronism in that Kikuchio is a character who probably didn't exist in the reality of 16th century Japan, but is, is Kurosawa's construct. And he not only expresses the contradiction between peasants and samurai, but actually lives it in his person.
Now, next day, in the pouring rain, Kikuchio has rejoined the samurai. He's back next door with the main group. And we return our focus, or Kurosawa returns his focus, to the question of this group as a group, as a seven-man army, as it were. And this is consolidated, of course, in the creation of the banner, which we're about to see unveiled. The banner has a very crucial symbolic significance. As we know, it consists of three symbolic representations, three at the top, six circles, underneath that one triangle, and underneath that the Chinese character that represents the farm and the villagers. So it's a symbolic representation of the way that the samurai are going to protect the community. The interesting thing, of course, is that one of the seven protagonists is represented as a triangle and not as a circle, and that, of course, is Kikuchio because he's not really a samurai. He's very disgruntled about that again, but in a way this returns us to the main theme of the film. Can that triangle become a circle? Can he really be a samurai? It's one of the dramatic focuses of interest that Kurosawa pursues all the way through. Kikuchio's sexual boasting, we've already seen some examples of it, and it's reaching overdrive at this point in the film, is possibly what drives Kyuzo, the swordsman, out into the rain to practice. It may be his disgust at listening to this kind of stuff that sends him outside. And ironically, outside, where he, like the other mature samurai, shows no interest in sex of any kind. I mean, their relationships are essentially with their own peers. And I think we've already noticed in the early part of the film that all of the most intense emotional moments have come with uh, the bonding between these men, the expressions of respect and affection that dominate their relationships. Anyway, outside, Kyuzo finds himself the uh, unwilling voyeur to the one strand of heterosexual romance that runs through this film, the secret meeting of Katsushiro and Shino, the peasant girl. The fact that Shino is now re-feminizing herself is already an early indication that she sees this as a burgeoning romance. And it reminds us that uh, the cutting of her hair was actually the second haircut in the movie. You remember the first one was when Kambei, the leader of the samurai, cut his hair or had his hair cut so that he could pose as a monk. I think it's not an accident that Kurosawa repeats motifs like this. Shino is not disguising herself as a monk or indeed as anything other than a boy, but that pattern of repeated motifs and variant motifs is one of the ways that Kurosawa uses to structure the film. Here, I think, one of the interesting things is the way that the rain is used to compress, shorten, and uh, generally keep this scene under control. It is a strand of heterosexual romance. We're supposed to perceive the developing relationship between these two hormonally charged young people. But as usual with Kurosawa, one thing leads to another, which is not an immediately obvious sequel. In this particular case, Shino draws our attention to a character we haven't yet seen, which is the village's oldest lady, um, who is starving because her child has been killed by the bandits. Here, back with the samurai at their dinner, this is simple plot establishment. It is through Katsushiro's declining a bowl of rice that the others learn that something is going on and that there is some other destination intended for the food that would have been his. And it leads us to this glimpse of this extremely old lady who makes only one other significant appearance in the film after the first of the bandits is captured and brought back to the village. She's not shown in extreme close-up, but she is given this one shot, which is held for quite a long time. And it's rather notable that this is the first of three extended close to medium shots of women in isolation that run through the film. Since this is a film mainly about male bonding, male camaraderie, male teamwork, most of the shots of the film are like the ones we're seeing now, groups of men in dynamic compositions, in twos, threes, fours, even sevens eventually. We do see three women in tight close-up, at different points in the film, and it's rather striking that Kurosawa chooses to reserve his close-ups, his largest shots, 
for these rather peripheral or minor women characters in a film that's predominantly masculine. It seems to me that this is psychologically at least preparing the viewer for a climax which will come a bit later and which of course will come to when it arises. The immediate dramatic thing here though is that Kikuchio is raging with resentment against this wretched old lady and it's become increasingly clear this is a sort of sequel to his outburst to the samurai about the way that samurai have made farmers what they are that his hatred is a kind of displacement his own resentment of his origins is being somehow displaced into contempt for the more wretched of the earth no. No. Kurosawa, meanwhile, has shifted his attention to these two, um, the impassive veteran Kyuzo and the hormonal young man Katsushiro. And this two-shot, which is very typical of the conversation scenes in the film, contrasts the impassivity of one, the reserve and control of one, with the extreme nervousness and dejection of the other. It leads us via this moment reminding us that time is passing and that the rice is getting ripe to a broader consideration of the way that this film is turning into a kind of anti-high noon. It is a film exactly about community, about team effort. In fact, as Kambe later tells Kikuchio when he goes off to try and get one of the guns for himself, this is not about individual effort. You're not getting any brownie points for breaking ranks and going off and doing things by yourself. You have to be part of the team. But Kikuchio is not exactly part of the team, and as this, this is one of the most overtly symbolic shots, in fact, in the entire film, because Kikuchio is positioned literally in between the samurai and the villagers, in this case, the children. And that is, of course, the social position that he finds himself in, but it's also a kind of moral position that he finds himself in, because it falls to him to mediate, to explain the one side to the other. And although his sympathies are broadly with the samurai, which is the position he aspires to himself, in many ways his behavior, his attitudes and his instincts are all very much locked into his peasant origins and background. There's a deliberate contrast that Kurosawa draws between Kikuchio playing to the kids, playing with the kids, entertaining the kids, pulling funny faces, doing cartoon-type jumps, and the behavior of Kambe, who is cradling a child throughout this scene. Uh, Kambe, who we learn nothing of his origins and background, but there's no indication in the film that he's ever been married or that he has children himself. So this scene in which he assumes a parental role, or uh, at least a paternal role, is an important one, I think, in terms of defining him. We suggested earlier that Kikuchio became, in his diatribe, a kind of mouthpiece for Kurosawa, but it's also important to note, I think, that he's not the only mouthpiece for Kurosawa in the film. In fact, Kambe's meticulous planning of the defense of the village is exactly equivalent to the director's planning of his film, and clearly Kambe is also, in some sense, a director surrogate in this movie. And so this behavior, showing himself to be versatile enough and adaptable enough to cradle a farmer's child as if it was his own child, is part of his maturity and his self-assurance and his ultimate competence. Now we move into the rudimentary training of the villagers to defend their territory. And this scene may remind us of actually one of the rejected ideas that Kurosawa contemplated before he reached this particular storyline for the film. Kurosawa's project, as we've already mentioned in passing at least, was to reinvent the Jidageki in some way, to take it into directions it hadn't previously taken in Japanese culture. And one of the ideas that he rejected was the idea of making a film about a series of famous legendary martial arts masters, swordsmen and people who were expert in other disciplines of fighting, and to show episodes from their life and their training. He eventually gave that up, but maybe this kind of scene in which the villagers are given this rudimentary training, I mean basic training you could call it, uh, is maybe one of the vestiges of that. But as you can see, Kurosawa doesn't pursue it. This is not a film about training, actually. It's a film about character formation. 
And so the thrust of the scene changes and we get these village rebels who are appalled at the idea that their homes are going to be sacrificed in the defense of the village because they lie outside the boundary of the field that's going to be flooded. And it gives us our first view of Kambe in action, very dramatically running, bearing his sword with Hayasaka's music playing in a very stirring way. And it begins to teach the villagers the necessary lesson of solidarity. There's already been quite a bit of emphasis in the film on the teamwork of the samurai. What is emerging now, and it becomes a crucial thing as the film progresses towards its ultimate climax, is that the villagers need to be part of that solidarity too. So lining them up as troops, holding their spears, preparing for the assault that we all know is going to come, is a crucial step towards achieving that kind of group solidarity that is going to if anything can, save this village from destruction. Now we'll come back to questions of Westerns in the moment and whether or not they influence Kurosawa and how this film in turn influenced Westerns, but this is obviously the moment to note that this is the absolute antithesis of the film High Noon, which is you know about a cowardly community hiding in the shadows and letting one honest, righteous, valorous man take the heat. This is precisely, as I said, about building the sense of community, teamwork and solidarity. Now, as the film moves towards its intermission, I mean, this is a very long film, nearly three and a half hours long, and it was always intended to play with an intermission. So Kurosawa structurally builds the intermission into the drama by climaxing part one, which is coming up momentarily, with this display of solidarity, the fact that the villagers are accepting uh, their necessary role as backups behind the samurai that they've hired, but at the same time stressing those elements of weakness that threaten to compromise the whole project. Those elements so far have been mostly associated with two characters, Katsushiro with his romantic uh, dalliance, which takes his mind off the matter in hand, and of course, lovable Kikuchio, whose impetuousness threatens all kinds of uh, disaster. Now, the film has this built-in five-minute intermission, and since there's nothing on the screen to comment on, it gives me a chance to talk about some of the broader issues underpinning the film. This, as we've already suggested, was part of Kurosawa's ongoing projects to reinvent the Jidaigeki. There are some interesting historical precedents in the 1930s, which you can, I'm sure, read about elsewhere if you want to know. But from Kurosawa's point of view, this project begins really in 1950 with Rashomon, essentially a literary adaptation and in some ways an experimental film. He pursues it a year later by writing a script for what would have been a somewhat more generic film. It's called Keto Kagiya no Tsuji, the duel at Kagiya's corner, literally, but I think Toho exported it under the title Vendetta of Samurai. This was a rewrite of a famous incident involving a samurai, a very well-known samurai figure from history called Araki Mataemon. But Kurosawa's script endlessly withdraws from the legend and questions it and suggests, was it really like this? Can we trust the wisdom that's been handed down to us? The interesting thing is that Kurosawa didn't want to direct this film himself. He handed the script to his contemporary Mori Issei and asked him to direct it. But the film did star Mifune, so it was, in a sense, part of Kurosawa's ongoing project. Anyhow, he returned to this in Seven Samurai, which is, is really his first full-scale Jiragegi and the first one that involves scenes of action-adventure. This was reached after a long period of deliberation, which involved a number of rejected ideas. One of them, for example, was the idea to follow one samurai through a typical day, and that was abandoned because they couldn't, the research didn't throw up much detail of how samurai did actually spend their time. Anyhow, Kurosawa, in the course of researching, came upon the information that some samurai in the 16th century had helped uh, peasant farmers for bed and board. And so from that nugget of information, he extrapolated this completely fictitious story. As we've already noted, there are a number of anachronisms in his perception of the period that run through the film. So this is not an act of historiography. This is not an attempt to reproduce the reality of the 16th century on the screen. It seems to me that the crucial influence on the direction that Kurosawa took the project in was his viewing of American films, and in particular the westerns of John Ford. 
This is already announced somewhat loudly in the very first shot of Seven Samurai, which is the bandits cresting the hill in that band of light under the lowering sky. And in fact, all the scenes involving horses and riders in this movie are very Western in feeling and, and not like anything much in previous Japanese cinema. But Seven Samurai is not really an Eastern Western, nothing about the historical or cultural context of the, the piece allows that kind of comparison to be made. It just doesn't work. Japan at this time was, was not a country being discovered and occupied by new settlers. It was, uh, on the contrary, a very stable ancient community, although it was riven by war. So what did Kurosawa learn from films like John Ford's Westerns? Well, I think one of the things he learned was the interwoven plotting, which tangles together the moral and sexual questions with all the issues about military strategy, how to defend a particular place and a particular community and which also brings into play that gap between the professionals, the experts in the field, and the civilians who are in the background. But also ideas such as that blend of drama and suspense and humor, which you find in Ford's films, but don't really find much in earlier Jidaigeki in Japan. It's also true that most Jidaigeki in Japan, particularly the ones with famous heroes at the center, didn't have protagonists who had real credible personal histories behind them. They're presented as almost mythological beings. So it's not really much of a surprise that since Kurosawa learned these things, I think, from American cinema, that this film in turn became such a, an, an extraordinary influence on American cinema, not only for the remake that John Sturges made in 1960, I mean, six years later, but also for much of Peckinpah and other later Westerns. Incidentally, one of the things that strikes me is that it may be one of the factors that, that led Kurosawa to reject filming in color in 1954. There'd been quite a few Japanese films in color already by this time, but Kurosawa didn't come to color until 1970, a full 16 years after this, and Todeska Den was his first color film. I mean, he was very dubious, famously, about color technology and felt the color wouldn't be good enough. But it's always struck me as extremely likely that Kurosawa stuck to black and white for a film like this because the images that influenced him from American cinema were precisely images in black and white. Now, the film resumes with harvest. Kurosawa often has a, an emphasis on changing patterns of weather and the changing seasons in his films, and he tries to make them very material to the action. But none is more material than this one, because obviously the arrival of the harvest is the trigger that's going to bring the bandits back to the village, so it's a crucial plot point. I should note in passing that these scenes right after the intermission are on the whole shorter, faster and more pointed than the ones before the intermission. There is a gathering pace in the film. I mean, this is a very long film in its entirety, something like three and a half hours. But Kurosawa, I think, sustains interest very well throughout it. And partly he does that by the way he interweaves different strands of plot, but also he does it more simply and more materially by altering the pace of the film. And here is a good case in point. These scenes are short, sharp, and absolutely to the point. Now, the emphasis here, of course, is on uh, Kikuchio's rampant sexuality. The samurai did not behave like this, and uh, it's a measure of, of uh, Kikuchio's shortcomings as a would-be samurai that he does behave like this. He's the only one of the samurai group, probably because he's not a full-fledged samurai, who openly expresses sexual desires and his behavior is in fact altogether much closer to his farmer roots than it would be to any kind of samurai behavior. This episode in the fields leads on to another episode in you know an adjacent field which brings to the fore another of the apparently unrelated strands in this movie. This is the question of Rikichi and his absence of a wife. It is normal for a farmer in his position, of course, to have a wife, just as it's normal for a ronin not to have a wife, or exceptional, let's say, for a ronin to have a wife. Ronin 
by definition are wandering the land and uh, looking for work, having been deprived of their clan employment, and they tend by definition to be rootless. Farmers, on the contrary, are rooted and build community and build family. And in fact, we've seen already that a number of people in the film, a number of characters in the film are disadvantaged because they've lost family members who would otherwise support them to the depredations of the bandits. No. Now, Rikichi is a special case. As we've noted already, his house has been selected as the billet for the samurai, and that's because he lives alone and therefore has the space to accommodate them. And it's the absence of a wife that provokes that comment that sends him stomping off in such a, a state and prompts the others to start worrying about him. Now, this, of course, is another element of anachronism in the film, in that I don't think people in 16th century Japan did discuss each other's uh, sexual and emotional problems in terms of having secrets bottled up inside them and looking for ways to coax them out through counselling of some kind. However, it's essential to Kurosawa's purpose in the film that this kind of anachronism is applied because Rikichi's secret, which is going to be revealed in due course, turns out to have some bearing on the film's sexual schema. It also connects, of course, with Kurosawa's lifelong interest in damaged lives. I mean, in, if you transposed Rikichi to the 20th century, he could easily be a character in Dodeska Den, the film that Kurosawa made about slum dwellers. This fireside scene, which is the attempted counselling of Rikichi, takes us into this realm of the spoken and the unspoken, what can be said and what cannot be said, which is another current that runs through the film, and which is actually centred on Rikichi, since Rikichi is the one who is unable to articulate his problems. There is a sentimental Japanese belief that some emotions cannot be expressed in words, but only intuited. In fact, there's a director called Yamada Yoji who has spent an entire career reiterating that very point in a series that he made of 45 films uh, called the Torosan series. And uh, Mr. Yamada has lately taken it into the Jidaigeki arena himself with the films Twilight Samurai and Hidden Blade, both of which have had some currency as, as latter-day samurai films. But Kurosawa rather typically takes a more pragmatic view of these questions. I mean, he's not a subscriber to most Japanese orthodoxies, and he certainly doesn't place much value in this notion that the Japanese have some secret antennae that enable them to communicate with each other at the intuitive level. On the contrary, he has much more identification in this scene, I think, with the samurai who thinks twice about pursuing this matter further because he sees that Rikichi is not going to answer or not yet ready to open up. Now, these next couple of scenes are both pretty short, and both of them are, are here mainly to push the plot forward. They're to do with the film's narrative development. And Kurosawa keeps them short and to the point. But both of them are presenting important plot points that are going to be crucial in the development of the defense of the village, as it's seen in the later part of part two of the film. Here, Kambei is confronting what he knows to be the two weakest links in his chain of defense. One is the samurai Katsushiro, who is left asleep, and they note in passing that he's murmuring a girl's name in his sleep, which is uh, their first indication that there's trouble of that sort in store. And then they go off to confront the other weak link, which is, of course, Kikuchiyo. Um, Kikuchiyo, not unexpectedly, is deeply asleep. And the way that Kambei deals with this problem is quite revealing. It's revealing of both Kurosawa and of Kambei as a character. Kambei decides not just to challenge Kikuchiyo with dereliction of duty, but to do so in such a way that encourages him to do better in future. So this is set up as some kind of test or challenge for him, not just a way of reprimanding him. Uh, this, of course, relates to Kurosawa's larger purpose, which is to do with character formation. And if we accept that Kikuchiyo is the most unformed of the characters, he's materially different from Katsushiro, the young man. Because Katsushiro was born into a certain way of life and is in the process of learning how best to fulfill his role in that way of life. Kikuchiyo is entirely different because he sees himself as being socially mobile, he comes from peasant background, but wants to become a samurai. In other words, he's the triangle who wants to turn into a circle. And the film is, as I said before, largely about that process. It's about what it will take to turn uh, Kikuchiyo's triangle into a circle.
this little lesson that he's just learnt in responsibility and teamwork is one small part of that process. Now, the ploughing of the fields, which is preparatory to flooding them, and which leads into directly the building of the moat that Canbe has decreed is necessary for the defence of the village, gives us a little montage sequence where again we see the characters enacting Canbe's plan. And it provides us, I mean, since this is narratively pretty straightforward, it gives us a chance to say something about Kurosawa's film language here. You notice there was a nice right to left wipe across there. However, this scene is mostly founded on mixes, visual dissolves. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see how Kurosawa, who was famously a perfectionist editor, chooses whether he's going to wipe or whether he's going to dissolve and whether he's going to wipe from left to right or right to left. My sense of uh, having looked at this film and other Kurosawa films quite many times is that it was largely an intuitive process for him. I don't detect any system in play. The natural way to wipe in Japanese film, uh, certainly of this period, is from right to left, because that was the reading direction in Japan in Japanese books and newspapers in the early 1950s. It still is in some books and newspapers now. And Kurosawa normally, I mean, that, that's kind of his default option if he wants to wipe. And for him, a wipe always denotes the passing of time, as it did at the beginning of this sequence. Sometimes, though, he wipes from left to right, and that seems to be related to the composition of the images. In any case, he always uses the wipe as a way of adding a certain dynamism to the material. Uh, Dissolve famously doesn't have dynamism. It elides things together. By contrast, the wipe replaces one image on the screen with another, and by actually dramatizing that replacement on the screen, it makes it, of course, more dynamic. <laughs> We're into one of the comedy episodes in the film, Kikuchio learning to ride Yohei's pony, and it provides a gag which I, I guess must have come from silent cinema. I can't place the exact origins of this gag, but it's certainly been copied many times since. One example that comes to my mind is the late Paul Bartel stole it more or less directly for his film Death Race 2000, uh, but I'm sure there are many, many other examples. But this little episode of horse play, and if you'll forgive the pun, is Kurosawa's way of enabling Kanbei to reassert the fundamental gravity of the situation. There is a recognition that, you know, the humor that Kikuchio brings to the uh, community and to pretty much everything he does in the community, in fact, is welcome, but at the same time a distraction from the, the seriousness of purpose and the gravity of the threat that they all face. I want to jump ahead a little bit to the upcoming scene because it relates to something I've been saying earlier. I noted that there are three significant close-ups of women in this film. The first was Kyuemon's granny, this very, very elderly lady who has been left essentially dispossessed and helpless because of the death of her son. Another one coming up later, and I don't want to get too far ahead, is Rikichi's wife who has been kidnapped and prostituted by the bandits. But coming up here in this particular scene, and as I noted 40 minutes ago, this bookends the section of the film that I'm commenting on, we have by far the biggest close-up in the entire film, and it's the moment when Shino finally offers herself to Katsushiro. What could be more terrifying to a young would-be samurai, a samurai in training, as it were, than a direct offer of... Uh, available sexuality from a young woman, a young woman furthermore whom he desires. But equally you could say in terms of the film itself, what could be more terrifying to the director than this image of unleashed female sexuality? These are by far the biggest close-ups in the entire film. They're also I think the scariest shot in the film. <laughs> Now, this is crucial to the film's sexual schema, but it's also crucial to the film's sense of the evolving personality of a samurai, what makes a true samurai. This is one of the things that a samurai has to confront and overcome. Katsushiro is a young man who has not yet lost his virginity, and he's, of course, terrified at the offer of the opportunity to do that very thing. 
It's traumatic for him. Uh, it's a huge disappointment for the girl who has indeed transgressed class barriers by offering herself to a samurai, and she knows full well that she's uh, incurring the impending wrath of her father by doing so. However, Kurosawa very typically deflects the moment into something else because the embarrassment, the mutual embarrassment of this encounter, this refusal of sex, uh, is suddenly erased by the immediate pressures of the moment, the sound of a horse neighing off screen, which denotes the long awaited, long feared arrival of the bandits. I think one of the many things that Kurosawa learnt from the Hollywood model was the way that you can balance between a focus on individual characters, their problems, and a broader picture. And what makes it particularly innovative here is the way that he has so many strands of storyline that run through it. All of these things come together in this film to produce a grand final statement that is to do with the end of the samurai class. And that is one of the reasons why this is such an enormous influence, not only on the Jidaigeki genre in Japan in subsequent years, but also actually on world cinema. Well, I think we have to leave that thought hanging in the air because it's now my turn to hand over the commentary baton to the next speaker. For the next 40 some minutes, this is Donald Ritchie taking over. One of the things that I remember best about Seven Samurai is that I was at the premiere of this. It was in 1954. It was here that was unveiled for me the extraordinary beauty of the full Kurosawa style. I'd seen other things. I mean, I'd known Kurosawa's work since Drunken Angel, but I hadn't seen anything of this caliber. And to see this at its premiere, it was an unforgettable occasion. Whenever I see the picture, and I've seen it a good many times since then, I always think of the premiere. Here we are beginning a section which reaffirms the unit, the Seven Samurai, brings them all back together again. The reason for doing this is that they are all based on social units. That is, we have the Seven Samurai, we have 30-some bandits, we have even more villagers, and these three units are usually kept separate, as they are here. We're shown one, then we're going to show the other. Later on, we'll be shown the bandits. Structurally, this is like the skeleton. This is like the bones upon which Seven Samurai rest. On top of that, we have the muscles, which certainly would include Mifune. And then we have the skin, which is the, the style, which is the look, which is the sheen of the picture itself. And one of the things about Seven Samurai is that you can take a single section, such as we're doing right here, and can uh, find in it a reflection of all the other sections. In any section which is taken, you will see these various patterns of which the film is made iterated, reiterated, or put in meaningful new positions with each other. Units are always emphasized much more strongly if we have an, an errant member of the unit. Uh, we have such an errant member among the farmers, which is the daughter. We don't have any among the bandits because we don't need it. But we certainly have one among the samurai. The errant unit is Kikuchio himself. He is the one who is very often at odds with the others and hence emphasizes their solidarity. We're coming up to a scene where he, uh, they are congratulating themselves that they have not been seen. But of course, Kikuchi opens his big mouth and he uh, ruins their plans. The bandits have seen him. Uh, this is just one of his many misdemeanors. But this is his role. He is the what? He's the mischief maker. He's the, the one who doesn't fit in. The, the fact that we have one who doesn't fit in means that we view the unit all the stronger. And in the end, of course, we have a long tableau at the end at his death, in which we find that he indeed is not only a member of the unit, but he stands for the unit entirely. So Kikuchio, in a way, defines uh, Seven Samurai as Mifune defines the picture. When we think of this picture, we think of a lot of things, but one of the things we think about is his reading of Kikuchio. It's very surprising then to realize that he was not originally intended to play the role of Kikuchio. He was originally intended to play the role that Miyagawa plays as the silent swordsman. 
I suppose you could have done it, but it, given his action of Kikuchi, it's almost impossible to imagine how he would have done it. But anyway, that's what it was uh, thought. There was only six samurai at that point. And somehow it didn't work. So Oguni and Kurosawa mainly, and Hashimoto, who wrote the script, cast about for a way in which they could en enliven things. And they got the idea of this uh, sort of comic errant uh, would-be samurai in the person of Kikuchio. And in this way, the role for Mifune was born. Mifune himself has said about this role that it was the most difficult work he ever had to do in his entire career. I think one of the reasons could be that it was against what? Against the kind of roles he'd done before, such as the bandit in Rashomon had certainly been that um, anic, but he hadn't been that amusing. Uh, his, his roles in the earliest pictures had been more or less heroic. They hadn't be, been comic. In this, he realized that he could be a comedian, and later on he would enrich his roles again and again. I'm thinking of his roles in Yojimbo, Sanjiro, uh, particularly the lower depths where a restrained comic ability is very, very evident. He enlarged himself through this particular role. And of course, he gave an identity and a memorability to the movie Seven Samurai that would not have had otherwise. One of the reasons that Mifune could make so much of his role is that there wasn't any real character to base anything on. All the other characters, or most of them at any rate, had some sort of real character behind them. That is, uh, the way they got the plot in the first place was that uh, Kurosawa discovered this historical anecdote where people in, in, a, in a village decided to hire Ronin, a uh, samurai, uh, to uh, protect them. And he thought, boy, we got a story here. And then he went through history and picked uh, people of probity or people of something else, great swordsmen and so forth, and sort of embroidered his characters based on those originals. Kikuchio didn't have any original. There was no farmer's son who wanted to be a Ronin so much that he was willing to work for nothing at all for a group of villagers that he never saw before. Uh, this freedom that he had is, of course, reflected in the performance of Mifune, I believe. All characters are given a memorable profile in this. For example, first they try to save the bandit, then all of a sudden, advancing upon them is this very old lady, which had she had been discovered by Kurosawa in an old folks' home, had never acted before in her life. And she's only on the screen about one minute or two minutes, and yet we know so much about her. We learn everything about her, and this identity, the mystery of the woman, is there because Kurosawa uses the no flute at this point to emphasize the otherworldliness of this. And that's the end of the lady, and yet I dare say we'll never forget her. She comes at such a point where we're emotionally so open, and even though she's based on no character at all, in almost all sections of this film, you will find moments like this, where it's repeated again and again, where people suddenly have three dimensions when they had only two before. Uh, no matter which section of this film you go to, you will find examples of this very close knitting by Kurosawa. <laughs> Again, we have returned, as we always do in these segments, to the ground base, to the Pasakalia like theme which runs through this picture. The unit, all seven samurai within one frame. We have the picture right there. This is uh, something which occurs uh, so we get them visually as well as thematically. We see them making their plans together. It reminds me in a way of Soviet films. It reminds me of films which emphasize the collective in this way. I, I always think of Dovshenko when I look at particularly this picture. I wonder if Kurosawa thought of Dovshenko. I have no idea. He, he'd seen Earth, I know that. But it makes me think of them because it makes me 
see him doing what the Soviets also do, which is to show something visually and thematically at the very same time. What he does with it after this, of course, is not exactly what Soviets do. He breaks it down into individuals at once. Individuals are as much more important to Kurosawa than the collective is. Uh, and as always, like again, like the Soviets, he cuts from contemplation into action right away. Uh, and very often he will very artfully put in uh, comic effects with these things, hold off a climax and at the same time intensify a climax, always on personal terms. And here we have that celebrated pan down, which shows the... Uh, Seven Samurai are going to the bandits, and it is interrupted by something which is unexpected, the wipe, which takes us directly into the studio, but it is so connected with the pan down that we instantly believe in it, and here, again from the left, come the samurai themselves. This sort of fluid editing is something, of course, which distinguishes this picture among all others, particularly, I mean, even among all others of Kurosawa. Uh, the, the fluid editing which makes everything not only smooth, but alive, vital. Uh, there's a kinetic quality of the editing, which makes it a, an, an editor's dream. Uh, very often, the Japanese who work with him will say that he may be the, one of the most uh, interesting directors alive, but the thing is that he's the world's best editor. This is what the professionals say about Kurosawa, and they're quite right. His editing never makes a mistake. It always illuminates, it reveals, and it makes things cohere. After the premiere, when the picture opened, there are a number of reviews. The majority of the reviews, as I remember, were very favorable. Certainly, all, all the foreign ones were extremely favorable. Officially, that is the, the way the government viewed it, is, uh, yeah, right on. I mean, as long as we Japanese stick together, we're going to make a good job of it. This is a simplification, but at least it's a favorable one. The way that Toho looked upon it, it's very strange indeed. Toho showed some patience in that they allowed Kurosawa to film it. At one point, they were going to take it away from him. He, would, he ran so over the budget, he ran so over the time limit. But eventually, it was finished. However, they never really... Uh, no, no director here has a, the, the right of final cut. This premiere that I saw was just about the only time that the Japanese were able to see the film if they'd been invited at all and for the last next 10, 20 years because the film was cut up, uh, was shortened by a good length. I mean, an hour it was cut out, something like that. And then it was released to the neighborhood theaters. So, so what they saw was a much truncated version. If you have a film that's th three something hours long, you cannot show it more than three times a day. But if you have one that's only two hours long, you can show that four times a day and you can get more people in and you can make more money. This is the way that motion picture companies usually think. And so this happened, then they sold it abroad, it got even worse. The RKO bought it initially and they made what they called an action version of it, which cut out even more. Other countries were a little bit more intelligent. Uh, Germany didn't cut it, Italy didn't cut it, France didn't cut it, nor did England. But none of them got the full version because Toho had taken the outtakes out and had re-edited the negative. So when you ordered a copy of Seven Samurai, you instantly got the truncated copy. For years, that's the only copy I knew. And yet I'd seen the full thing at the premiere. I knew what it was like. I knew what was missing. Decades later, contradicted complaints finally moved Toho to find the outtakes and to put them back in the negative and to finally mint a complete negative. This is what we have now. It is now possible to see the complete Seven Samurai, but it took a long time to achieve it. Burning down expensive sets is uh, later to be one of the givens in a Kurosawa film. One remembers the set in Ran, which is astonishingly authentic. Uh, could you say this is part of the, what, the gist of any Kurosawa personality on film, this, this willful need to burn down elaborate and expensive shelters? I can't think of anything before this picture, uh, but after this picture, there's been quite a few sets which have set on fire. Well, one of the ways to think about them is that they are spectacular. Fire is one of the most spectacular things on Earth. I mean, when Tarkovsky wanted to make a fitting 
conclusion for sacrifice. He could think of nothing better. Indeed, there would be nothing better than to set the whole house on fire. I think one of the reasons Kurosawa is interested is that it is all action. It gives us something to look at. It would be equally effective without color. It would be equally effective without sound. I think that the quality of action is one of the things which must have appealed to Kurosawa. The interesting thing here is that the set fire sort of gets out of hand, and we see Tsuchiya trying to get back in again, but unable to do so. At the end of this, the filming of this sequence, Tsuchiya wasn't badly burned, but he had blisters all over him, uh, and he didn't keep uh, his place like Kurosawa had told him to. He kept falling back. So most of the footage was used, to be sure, but it wasn't exactly what the director had envisioned. And uh, so finally he's rescued, as we see here. And at that point, then he tells us why we have had this buildup, why we have had the, the, the mystic flute under the lady, why we've had such a spectacular fire. It motivates this somewhat mysterious character of the farmer that Tsuchiya is playing. And he gives the reason, and suddenly we know what it is that motivates this particular part of the plot. <laughs> Let's examine what it is that we have been shown in this sequence. We have been shown the mysterious woman and the revelation has been made. We have been shown the first successful attack, the first battle, practically two-thirds away through the entire film. We have seen the death of uh, the first samurai. Uh, all of this we have seen in just a matter of, of minutes. These units have a way of moving very, very swiftly. Here we have another illustration of what is occurring. This is pictorialized, again, against an open sky in which one might call the Soviet style, in which the sword on one hand and the samurai on the other seems to be asking us to complete the composition. We have the feeling that this is going to that we're counting something, that something inevitable is going on. Uh, this is something that is felt and is demonstrated now by Kikuchio, who makes a gesture which is going to bond again the idea of a group. Mifune feels and the director feels, and consequently we feel, that some sort of bonding is supposed to occur at this dramatic point where one of the men is, and one who we like, you know, more than maybe some of the others. Uh, he's been wantonly killed. Someone once said that uh, the times in which he lived influenced the moral message of Kurosawa's achievement. The fact that uh, Drunken Angel, for example, was filmed in 1947 and yet ended on a note of uplift. The fact that Rashomon, 1951, ended also equally on a note of uplift that other pictures have as well, uh, indicates that in 1947, 1951, the Japanese people were themselves concerned with being optimistic, were concerned with uplift. However, when we get to 1954, we get to a, a different kind of period where the people might be but more disillusioned, so we get ambivalent endings, such as the ambivalent ending of Seven Samurai and other ambivalent endings to come. I don't think that's true. I think what we have, rather, is a man who always sticks to the same theme, but he allows himself to interpret this theme in different ways. The theme, uh, he told me once, I, I asked him, uh, what are your movies about? Which is about the dumbest question you can ask. And he said, um, they're about why people aren't nicer to each other. Now, I thought it was a pretty dumb answer, but I can see now that it was one short way to shut me up. But beyond that, it was also telling the truth. He is truly concerned that people are pretty awful to each other. And this awfulness can be, you know, either succumb to or you can get over it. And he has given us various recipes, if you want to reduce it to that, in his pictures about uh, how people can get along and can be nice with other people and how they can't. Uh, he, uh, the, the people in 
drunken angel, at least the ones that are left, are going to get along together and we're going to have a better life. Uh, this is true of the people in Russia one as well. However, he's not interested in doing this in, in, in a picture like the Seven Samurai anymore that he's interested in doing this in High and Low, for example, where the ending is completely ambivalent. Uh, one could say that he matured to the extent that he saw that easy optimism was not the way out. But even that, I wonder if that's true. I think he liked to experiment. I think he liked to show action which could lead to different things. I think he is much more the carpenter than we usually give him credit for being. Notice the choreography. Remember when we saw the uh, bandits pouring down over the hill? It's always interesting to, to think about where a director got his images from, since there's very few things original in this world. A thing I've often heard is that this, uh, the bandits cascading down the mountainside is something which he obviously took from the westerns. Well, which western this would be, I don't know. I don't think it came from the westerns at all. I think it came probably from the Japanese tradition of this being the way to introduce an enemy. It may have come originally from pictures like Henry V of Laurence Olivier, which was very widely seen in Japan, or it may be the earlier Russians, uh, certain Russian pictures which had descents down mountainsides of this kind. At any rate, it's been used many times before. In Kurosawa's picture here, I prefer to think of this kind of choreography as rather part of the legacy of the that the period film had already attained by the time that Kurosawa had started working. Uh, we, we, we have in pictures of uh, Manzaku Itami, for example, or Inagaki Hiroshi. We have uh, uh, pictures of, of units behaving in just this same way. This is one of the things to do, is to have the sudden appearance of the enemy galvanize our guys, the samurai who are waiting below. Uh, this is a known trope. This is a way of, this is like a metaphor. This is a way of speaking. I don't think that any Western was, you know, uh, American picture was needed to set this off. I think this is you know, part of the home culture of the Japanese cinema, no matter where it came from. <laughs> from now on, it's going to be practically all action, except for a few lulls here and there. Uh, after he'd made the film, even while he was making it, Kurosawa said that he wanted to make a real moving picture. And so, how you make it move? You make it move through action. And through action which is explanatory, which you know uh, what the action is for. We have the quiet scene here, but it is filled with action because we are keeping count not only of the samurai now, we're keeping count of the bandits that we have killed. <laughs> Everything has to be actionized. Uh, we have to have even more movement than we have had before. Uh, this idea of movement as part of the storytelling technique, of course, is something that movies have always had from their very inception. And this is particularly true of movies when they couldn't talk. The influence of the silent cinema on Kurosawa has been many times mentioned, including the things like the famous walk in Rashomon, the walk of the woodcutter which people have said looks like silent film and so forth. Well, things that look like silent film, like the like the, the, the things in silent film, like it couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't depend upon words, uh, is one of the ideals of Kurosawa. And indeed, there are far less words in the second half of Seven Samurai than there are in the first half of Seven Samurai. We grow into a new kind of silence. Uh, but this silence is filled with uh, noise and is filled with action, and this makes the choreographic spectacle of it, even a domestic scene like the one that we're looking at now, is going to be filled with potential action. Uh, and we get, uh, what, foreshadowings of this. Even objects like that uh, watermill out there have been given the potential of action. The very fact at this point in this very fast-moving film that Kurosawa shows us anything at all indicates that that scene has a future. It's like it's somebody who's who's taking rice plants and putting them one by one into the ground and we're going to watch them fruitate in a matter of seconds and blossom and turn into something ripe that we can consume. 
and can therefore understand more or feel more about the picture. Throughout, uh, he has telegraphed us uh, things which turn out to be points that increase our appreciation of action, our appreciation of the theme of the picture, our appreciation of that all-enveloping arch of this film which questions the whole idea of the aims of humanity. All of these things have been very, very carefully prepared for. Dialogue becomes less and less important as Seven Samurai continues. It's as though film is returning to its silent roots where action is everything. One of the things we have to note is geographical spontaneity, uh, as though everything is next door to everything else. Uh, in point of fact, although the village was a unit, all the other things were miles away. Uh, these were uh, things that had been built way out in the countryside, so to get from one scene to another involved buses and cars and goodness knows what. And the, uh, the idea of proximity was built in the editing room in which all of these were united. This is, is, is ordinary in filmmaking. This happens again and again and again in all sorts of films. But you don't get the tremendous feeling of authenticity that you do. We don't question but what this stream is right next or is in, in the middle of the town. I don't know, but it may very well be five miles away. We don't think of it. We don't question it. Uh, and I think this is because of the astonishing veracity of the of the editing itself, which doesn't give us, one, time to think. Uh, two, it, it makes us want not to think. Uh, it wants to paralyze our thinking things because we have our feeling things on to full volume right now. And it will get more and more until finally the emotions become deafening at the end of this picture. You'll notice another uh, technique through which action is affirmed and our attention is guaranteed. The length of each cut of each scene uh, very gradually gets shorter. Uh, not in any way you can uh, you, you put on a graph and mention it, but uh, in feeling, you'll find toward the end of the film many more shorter scenes than they were at the beginning of the film. This is a very well-known method for increasing the blood pressure and the heartbeat and anxiety and making sweat stand out on the forehead. This is a way to bring us into things. Uh, this kind of short, terse editing has been known practically since the first or second decade of the existence of films. However, the way to modulate it, the way to orchestrate it, the way to really make it work has been discovered by very few directors. Eisenstein would be one of them. Uh, I can think of several others. And then, of course, this Kurosawa. <laughs> this sequence is among what one might call key sequences because we have here iterated yet again, as we have seen in many other sections, uh, what the man is saying is that those old shacks don't make any difference. But of course, those old shacks, that's his house that he's talking about. The fact that he is says, okay, let it burn down. What's more important than my house, than me, is the collective, is this village with our samurai protectors, that this is what is important. And here we have the, the villagers convinced, or at least one member of them, convinced of this. And so solidarity, which is one of the things that this film is about, is uh, achieved in this. But something else is going to be achieved very shortly because we all came from someplace and we all of us have our past and we're all of us selfish to a degree. And what is going to happen next is an uh, extremely beautiful sequence, which is very, very famous, rightly so, in which we see sort of an alternate to this ideal of the purity of the group, the nobility of this uh, intention of everybody having the same direction and going to and all thinking the same thing. Here we have plainly individual terms in which a, a mortally wounded mother holds out the child, Mifuni takes it, and in back of us something extraordinary is going on, a water wheel on fire. Now we can say, well, things happen in war. But if we think about that, water doesn't burn. It's like 
I've always thought this sequence was a little bit like a miracle. I mean, here we have what appears to be water burning. We have him up to his knees in water. We have, he, he, he's all set to have a revelation. And this is what he does. He, he remembers that he himself was rescued, apparently, as a child when he was a farmer's child, much like this, that something this personal is being repeated again and again. And as though a chorus to answer this comes the burning wheel. And what happens to all burning wheels? They go out. Kurosawa's collectives have much more to do with the humanity of the people involved rather than the political power that they achieve by collectivizing themselves. I don't think that Kurosawa has any political aims, except insofar as it would make for a better society for everybody. No, his aims are completely humanistic. One of the strengths of the picture is that on our side of the uh, war, there are no anonymous people. Everybody is known, or at least they are capable of being understood if we were but to take the trouble to do so. However, this does not hold the bandit. Any glimpse of the bandit see them more like animals. They are not given personifications. If one were talking about a truly humanistic cinema, then one might be able to say that there's something the matter with the picture. However, that's not the kind of picture that Kurosawa is making, even though he's making a humanistic statement. I think if you had a picture in which the enemy was as detailed as our side was, you'd have a picture which was a quite a different kind of picture. You'd have a picture perhaps more like uh, Grand Illusion, perhaps of, of Renoir, where things are equated and the entire idea of struggle is thus negated. And Kurosawa is not about this. He's saying that struggle is absolutely necessary. And you have to learn to struggle in order to find yourself. It is this idea of anonymity which lends uh, fright and horror and all the rest to the picture, but also lends us its excitement. This section that we have looked at, these 40 minutes, have a number of things which share, of course, not only with the film itself and its other units, but also with the whole uh, entire work. One of the things which we'll notice, of course, is the position of, of Kambe. Uh, he is an archetypal character, such as we find from the very first of Kurosawa's films on. He was the teacher, the sensei in the very first film, Sugata Sanchiro. Uh, he, 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 he was sensei for another school, but he was still sensei. And he's the one that taught Sugata a few tricks that he was not to forget. Later on, he was the, the doctor in Drunken Angel, and he taught the Yakuza Mifune a few things. Later on, he was the head detective in Stray Dog, and he taught the young cop who lost his pistol quite a few things in that one. And here we have him as Kambe. He's teaching people. This master-disciple unit is something which is very important to Kurosawa. Later on, he would show it in his fullest forms in Redbeard, where Mifune was, had now taken over the Shimura part, and Mifune was the teacher. But the, the shape of the lesson learned always remains the same. The teacher knows something not only material, not only military, not only skillful. He knows something spiritual. He knows about the virtues of trying over and over again. He knows that it is possible to do things in the most impossible circumstances. It is this kind of wisdom, only seven samurai, 30 some bandits, and yet they manage to kill them all, even though that doesn't win the war for them. It is this sort of knowledge that Kurosawa is concerned about, and it is this pattern, this archetypal pattern, which he repeats over and over again in his films. Kurosawa films like a fruitcake. It's, it's absolutely filled with stuff, but it's always the same stuff. And no matter where you cut it, you can find wonderful salient examples of this. <laughs> Yes, 
かし物音一つせぬが Discipline, as you can imagine, was everything to Kurosawa. And in order to attain this, he had a couple of bad habits. I think one of the worst of the habits that Kurosawa had was that he would very often pick out a member of his crew or his cast to bully, to、uh, make an object of. And Kurosawa would be angry and would shout and would march off the set and do all sorts of things. Now, maybe he really felt this about the person, that's quite possible. On the other hand, doing this to a person has a number of advantages, one of which is that it、uh, gives him an excuse to stop anything he wants to stop. Two, it, it frightens the rest of the cast into what they would hope to be good behavior. Three, it,、uh, if you really have a recalcitrant actor, it may shock him into giving some kind of performance. In Seven Samurai, the one he picked out to be the goat was the Actor named Inaba, who plays Gorobe. Gorobe could do nothing right. I don't know, I wasn't on the set, I couldn't tell, but I can't imagine an actor being consistently so bad as to be treated like that all the time. I think that Kurosawa probably had his reasons for treating Gorobe badly. Gorobe told friends of mine afterwards that he had never been through anything like this in his life and he never would again. And indeed, Gorobe, the actor, made very few other films. Never again did he have a part this large. One is not surprised at this. One hears, I mean, John Ford did the same thing. He was always picking on somebody in his unit to make a statement about.、Uh, you know, during the famous bridge games after the shoot, this person would be excluded, or everybody would sit down and have a meal and he wouldn't be invited, that sort of thing. Whether Kurosawa went you know, to that extreme or not, I don't know. But at any rate, he always picked somebody. The miracle is that the guy who plays Inaba, the guy who plays Gorobe, does a terrific job of it, despite everything. You believe in him? Maybe this is the miracle of cutting, but,、uh, or maybe it's that Kurosawa's theory works. Maybe that he'd frightened the guy so much that he turned into splendid performance. I don't know. And with that, I will turn you over to your next and final editor, Joan Mellon, who has the ability and the enormous honor of doing this remarkable final sequence. Joan knows her Kurosawa. It was、uh, Joan that helped me a lot in the second edition of、uh, my Kurosawa book in writing up at least two or three of the films for me, and they are so credited and they so appear in the volume. I'm Joan Mellon, the author of Voices from the Japanese Cinema, The Waves at Genji's Door, and two British Film Institute books, one about Nagisa Oshima's In the Realm of the Senses, another about Seven Samurai. There's no question but that Seven Samurai is not only a classic but a masterpiece, perhaps the greatest Japanese film ever made. Certainly, it's a member of anyone's top ten best films in the history of cinema. Seven Samurai is Akira Kurosawa's finest film. Kurosawa has ranked this film, along with Ikiru, as his own personal favorites. As the last of five commentators, I'm taking you through the final 40 minutes of the film when Kurosawa's film coalesces, when the directorial perspective emerges fully and Kurosawa can speak to the spectator about what concerns him most. A central theme of Seven Samurai is that for the sake of protection of the community, the individual must subordinate his own needs to those of the group. Personal glorification is a notion antithetical to the code of Bushido as practiced by the best of the samurai. Kikuchio goes through a learning process throughout the film, from being an egocentric farmer's son through emulating the selfless dedication to the samurai spirit as practiced by the six hereditary samurai. He will come to understand the value of the samurai class and its contribution to Japanese history and culture. Sorry. So it is one thing for Kyuzo to disappear into the mist and invade the camp of the bandits, and another for the willful Kikuchio to attempt the same thing. Kyuzo embodies the samurai spirit, not least in his understated response, killed too. A samurai defines himself not by words, but by action. Kurosawa films Kyuzo from a low angle looking up. The better to suggest the spiritual power of his samurai identity. 
Extreme close-ups are another means Kurosawa enlists to speak to the value he discovers in the samurai character at its best. Yet at other times in Seven Samurai, however, Kurosawa will film the samurai from a slightly high angle, looking down on them, to foreshadow the theme that will emerge fully only at the end of the film. As valuable as the samurai have been to Japanese society, they are about to depart from this stage of history. Kurosawa does not film the two men in the same shot for several reasons. One is that Katsushiro is not yet a full-fledged samurai. He will truly join the samurai class only after he kills his first man. Another reason for Kurosawa's use of the cut here is to foreshadow Kiyuzo's death. Kiyuzo and Katsushiro are soon destined to part forever. Still another reason for Kurosawa's fragmenting his depiction of the samurai is that the samurai way of life has become increasingly vulnerable. And even the solidarity of like-minded men honoring a noble code will not be sufficient to save the samurai class from extinction. In the battle that follows Kiyuzo's visit to the enemy camp, Gorobei assumes leadership. So, gracefully, each samurai may take the primary role. The central theme remains that the needs of the group transcend any glory that might fall to a given individual. Gorobei joined the group because he was fascinated by Kanbei's character. They are brothers in their wisdom and in their approach to the samurai ethic, and it is Gorobei's death that Kanbei will feel most profoundly, as we will see later in the film. Of course, Seven Samurai is not only a philosophical film, a speculation on values and on history, although it is certainly that. It is also an action film, and the battle scenes flourish as both entertainment as an embodiment of the winds of historical change, a favorite Kurosawa metaphor that will lead us to the demise of the samurai class, no matter how many battles are won. This focus on historical upheaval, on moments of transition in history, the passing of one epoch, and that moment when the next has not yet come into being, a theme to which I will return, is expressed by Kurosawa filmically through his singular dynamic editing style. As we look at the next four minutes of the film, I want you to look at Kurosawa as the heir to Eisenstein. Through the juxtaposition of shots, the collision of movement. This is only one of several battle scenes where we see Kurosawa's indebtedness to Eisenstein. That Kurosawa is connected to Eisenstein is not surprising given Kurosawa's early attraction to Marxism and left-wing movements in the Japan of the 1930s. Kurosawa's passion is historical change and inevitably conflict. Battle scenes are perfect emblems of such progress, for good or ill. He believes men can be best known not by their words but by their actions. His samurai are men of few words, while his shots are filled with movement, just as Eisenstein's are. Men, horses, peasants, samurai, while the eye travels deep into the shot, so that as with Eisenstein, the spectator is as active as the characters in the film. Like his master Eisenstein, Kurosawa embodies the theme of social conflict in his editing style. Because impermanence is a major theme in Seven Samurai, the takes are short. The shot piece is often temporally so small that a shot appears on screen only long enough for the spectator to perceive what is happening and not a second longer. And in Eisenstein, this would be the conflict between a long take and a short take. Any kind of conflict that shows the contrast is what Eisenstein was looking for, and Kurosawa really does the same thing. The bandits ride forward and Kurosawa cuts, as Eisenstein would. A horse struggles in the mud and Kurosawa cuts. The feet of men and horses become interchangeable. All are subject to the exigencies of the environment, to the horror of battle, and to the great cost of war. And just as Eisenstein made famous crowd scenes, a technique that he borrowed from Griffith, so we see the same thing here in Seven Samurai. We can compare Eisenstein as a political filmmaker with Kurosawa. Both believe in the sense of progress, that society can be made better, that through conflict, through the establishment of good values, basic values, through struggle, a better society will emerge. And we see that in the Kurosawa of Seven Samurai, maybe not in the late Kurosawa, but certainly in 1954 when Kurosawa made Seven Samurai. He believes that by showing an example of how people act well, live rightly, society can be improved. 
And we certainly see that in Eisenstein's films as well. This is straight comic relief in a way. Here we would see Kikuchio attacking and allowing his peasants notice that he allows the peasants to dispatch the invading bandit rather than doing it himself. By the way, there he exemplifies the samurai spirit and we can see that exemplified in his walking off with the others there at the end of that little scene. These scenes that follow the two forays into the enemy camp, the first by Kyuzo, the second by Kikuchio, are a little schematic. They suggest object lessons. Kyuzo did the right thing because he has the skills and he can be trusted. Kikuchio is too impulsive, too emotional, and therefore he shouldn't be allowed to leave his post. If you look at Kiyuzo's expression, I think you can see that he understands that they're becoming so overconfident they may not be able to fight effectively. It's very important in the film that Kurosawa uses this chart whereby Kambe marks off the number of bandits who have been killed. It's a way that the spectator has of keeping control of the situation. And that leads directly to this moment where Katsushiro is infuriating Kikuchio by praising Kyuzo so much. And of course, what Kikuchio is thinking is that he's just as good. And if Kyuzo can go to the enemy camp and capture a gun, well, he's going to do the same thing. And he doesn't see any difference. I think he's not, perhaps not as intelligent as Kyuzo and is certainly not as disciplined but it's irresistible for him. He's acting on emotion, and that's one of the points of the film. One of the things that Kurosawa admires so much about Kanbei is that he's not emotional and that he makes his decisions based on logic and based on what he thinks is going to happen, that he can predict what's going to happen. Here, Kikuchio runs off. Yohei tries to stop him. Kikuchio here cannot imagine that his little group of peasants is going to be made so much more vulnerable by the action that Kikuchio is going to take in going off to the bandit camp without permission entirely on his own. The music is light as Kikuchio makes his own reckless raid into the enemy camp, the traveling shot attempting to keep up with him as animal-like he penetrates the forest allows Kurosawa to film from the point of view of a less than reliable character, one who allows personal desire, the need to distinguish himself and to prove himself as a samurai, to override his understanding of the need of the individual to subordinate himself to the group. In the scenes of Kikuchio in the enemy camp, Kurosawa elaborates upon the animal imagery with which this character has been associated from the moment of his first appearance in the mise-en-scene. Kurosawa enlisted the conceit of men as animals in Stray Dog as well, but to greatest effect in Rashomon, where Machiko Kyo was instructed to imitate a leopard and the bandit Tajumaru, played by Mifune, to impersonate a roaming lion. Like a dog, Kikuchio sniffs out his enemies. The sound of his breathing heavily animates the soundtrack. Like an animal, he scratches himself without inhibition. Kyuzo, Kambe, Gorobe, these samurai are essentially cerebral. They are men of intellect. Kikuchio, not a samurai by birth, exhibits none of their intellectual disinterestedness and fortitude. Throughout, one feels Kurosawa's consciousness of his own samurai heritage and of the samurai spirit embodied by his rigorous disciplinarian father. The last part of the film also focuses on the coming technology that materially presaged the departure of the warrior class from the social landscape. In the symbolism of Seven Samurai, the sword represents the soul of the warrior. It represents his integrity. It represents his social function. But we also have the introduction in this film of the gun, which represents the future. It represents the military of Kurosawa's own time. And it represents a moment in history when the samurai will no longer have a place in the society at all. It's something the samurai fear. It's an object as symbolic as it is real in the film. And of course, Kurosawa draws out that symbolism by having every one of the samurai who dies die by the gun rather than by the sword. Here we see Kikuchio showing his cleverness. Here he's taking the armor off the dead bandit and disguising himself. So he really is quite capable of being a samurai. There's the characteristic Kurosawa wipe.
Now, here's Kikuchio running through the forest. Note that the musical motif is the motif particularly attached to this character and also a motif that's attached to the samurai in general. Notice fearlessness as uh, he comes upon this man. Notice complete self-confidence, characteristics that have stood him very well in assimilating himself into the samurai group. He pretends to be one of the bandits, as indeed we have to remember that the bandits are Ronin themselves, disenfranchised samurai. He's so successful that the bandit hands the gun over, doesn't mind, and then, look, Kikuchio returns the gun to him, so confident is he in his sword and the fact that he'll be able to dispatch this character. The man can't believe his eyes until he realizes that, in fact, this particular samurai is not one of his group, but belongs to the village. And, of course, there he is, dispatching the man in long shot, which suggests, of course, also that Kurosawa is not particularly favoring this unilateral action on Kikuchio's part, because note that the bandits then follow him and enter the village against the wishes of Kambe, as we saw earlier in the film, that only one be permitted to enter the village at one time. Punctuating the soundtrack here, the sound of gunfire, which remind us really of the fall of the samurai class because this new technology is going to make this whole group obsolete. <laughs> When Kikuchio returns, through Kambei's anger, Kurosawa reiterates the central theme of the film. Kambei denounces Kikuchio for leaving his post, for abandoning those whom he was assigned to protect, and for the selfish individualism that Kambei and Kurosawa believe can produce only disastrous results. The man who thinks only of himself will preside not only over his own destruction, but of that of the community as well an intolerable consequence for Kurosawa, whose early political inclination, as I said, was toward Marxism and to the left-wing tendency which had considerable influence in Japan in the early 30s when Kurosawa came of age. Many of the shot compositions of Seven Samurai reflect Kurosawa's endorsement of Kambei's statement that in war it's teamwork that counts. A host of shots portray samurai and peasants both as they are united in their common struggle. As befitting the social hierarchy of that historical moment, most often samurai are placed in the foreground of the shot, peasants at the rear. We're about to see another battle scene. Rather than talk about then, I'd like to call your attention to another of Kurosawa's films, and it's another film that shows the notion of selfless dedication to the group. I'm talking about Ikiru, which is set at the post-war moment. Ikiru was released in 1952, the year of the departure of the American occupation. In Ikiru, the quintessential Kurosawa hero, Watanabe, like Kambe, played by Takashi Shimura, discovers that helping others, having a swamp drained and a playground constructed for poor children, alone makes life meaningful. It takes Watanabe's imminent death, he is dying of stomach cancer, for him to discover this essential truth, that your life should be more about others than about yourself. It is a theme Kurosawa believes, imbibed by true members of the samurai class from birth. For Kurosawa, the issue for both Kambe and Watanabe is not giri or duty, sacrificing yourself for the sake of others or to obey a set of rules. Rather, Kurosawa's point is that the meaning of life resides in solidarity with others. Kikuchio's failure to perceive that there is the greatest strength in solidarity bear serious consequences. Here he reveals his great ability as a realist, depicting what battle actually feels like. You see only the immediate moment in which you personally are involved. The larger configuration eludes you. Only Kambe, the leader, possesses that greater vision. Otherwise, survival in battle is as much a matter of chance as it is courage or skill. And for all these battles, for all the depiction of war, I think we can see Kurosawa as an anti-war director. There's no great joy in war. There's no great feeling of happiness or relief. 
the samurai use their swords, it's all they have, this is their skill, or sometimes the bow and arrow, as we see here. Archery was, of course, one of the great samurai skills as well. But life is brutish and short for everybody in war, and Kurosawa makes that point over and over again in these scenes. I think we should note also that because the bandits are also samurai, they're using bow and arrow as well. Here we see first Yohei dying, and he dies as a result of what Kikuchio has done, that Kikuchio left his post and left the team of peasants he was instructing vulnerable to the bandits. And so Yohei, who has been one of the important peasant figures in the film, dies at this point in the film. <laughs> The peasants die by bow and arrow, they die by spears, they die by the sword, but I don't think it's too early to note that all of the samurai who die will die by gunshot. They're too skilled and Kurosawa idealizes them to a point where only the gun, the new technology, can defeat them. <laughs> There's the sound of the gunshot. To commemorate this fallen hero, Kurosawa bleeds all sound out of the track. All we hear are the running feet of Kambe, Katsushiro, and Kikuchio, and the elegiac musical motif associated with the samurai, and then Kambe's cry, Gorobe. That there are separate musical motifs for the peasants and the samurai and a different motif for Kikuchio and the other samurai is Kurosawa's way of expressing his view of the ultimate separateness of these social classes. This separation both expresses the different qualities each possesses and, ultimately, the vulnerability of the samurai who have been placed and placed themselves above the lives and needs of ordinary men and women. Shots of the graves of the fallen samurai will begin to enter the background from this point of the film onward as Kurosawa begins the film's own mourning experience. Seven Samurai can be seen as an elegy to the departure from history of the samurai class, which, at its best, for Kurosawa embodied the highest and most noble characteristics accessible to the species. The themes of the separation of the classes, peasants and samurai, the theme of the nobility of samurai identity, and the theme that through solidarity and comradeship alone can men survive and endure, all emerge in the penultimate sequence of the film, the night before the final battle. His depiction of this last night, a stasis that will meet the furious action of those final scenes, reveals Kurosawa at the height of his powers as a master of cinema and among the handful of great directors ever to work in the medium. This shift tonight is unique to the film. All action has ceased. Kurosawa uses this night to elaborate on characterization, to reiterate the uniqueness of each individual samurai, and to allow the samurai to interact with each other as men. We're also going to see parallel action, a technique that Kurosawa has borrowed from Eisenstein, who borrowed it from D.W. Griffith. In choosing parallel action, to tell his story, Kurosawa adds a democratic motif that will continue to the moment of the death of Kikuchio. Samurai and peasants, he is suggesting, are equal in human value. And so, alternately, in this penultimate sequence, he's going to cut between samurai and peasants. He moves from one samurai to another. Each will be depicted in a characteristic stance. Here in this three shot, it's Kambe and Kyuzo who are consulting. Katsushiro has not yet been initiated into the samurai class. Remember that he has not yet killed his first man, and so we see him nodding in the background of the shot. Note that Kambe is slightly forward, Kyuzo slightly behind. There's Shichiroji sleeping with his hands tightly clasped around his weapon, as if, even in sleep, he were ready for battle. And it's going to be Katsushiro who provides the link from one samurai to another as he conveys the message here to Shichiroji.
Throughout this nighttime sequence, Kurosawa reinforces that samurai and peasants will be forever separated. By class distinction is by social function. Shichiroji is kindly but superior, as, in a moment, he will send the peasants home to their families. Quiet adds old-fashioned suspense to the film. As we know, the final battle is yet to come. From shots of the samurai, Kurosawa will cut to the scene of the consummation of the love between Katsushiro and Shino. The shots of Shino and Katsushiro are alternated, as we'll see, with shots of Shino's father, Manzo, who, in his gathering rage, will pursue the young couple, although he will be too late to prevent them from consummating their passion. There are matches on action which slow down the film so that Kurosawa can emphasize those moments where his themes most fully emerge. For example, in Shichiroji's later attempt to reconcile Manzo to the loss of his daughter's virginity at the hands of a samurai. Kurosawa enlists symbolism, reframing the shots featuring the burgeoning bonfire, an emblem of the rising passion between the young lovers. Kurosawa's signature use of the telephoto lens allows him to collapse space so that the lovers seem so close to the fire that they are all but consumed by it, as indeed they are engulfed by their desire for each other. By the end of the sequence, Shino sobs will form a musical motif of their own, at once diegetic, reflecting her pain at the inevitable coming separation from her lover, and non-diegetically, as if her pain symbolized the pain of everyone at this moment, where life and death hang in the balance. The final battle is only hours away. There is a match on action as Shino and Katsushiro consummate their love. It is as if Kurosawa, knowing that there can be no permanent alliance between a peasant woman and a samurai, extends the duration of their lovemaking in homage to an egalitarian view that would indeed transcend class distinctions and sanction the love between these two young people. Kurosawa remains both fully aware that he is depicting feudal society when class distinctions were inviolate, while simultaneously hoping that historical change was presaging the breakdown of traditional class barriers. Kurosawa is suggesting that as admirable as the samurai are, class distinctions themselves make no sense. Nowhere better is this view expressed than in the hopelessness of the love between Katsushiro and Shino. That they consummate their love at all is a sign of the vulnerability of rigid class distinctions and the director's hope that ultimately class separation will give way to a democratization of social life and a corresponding alteration to the fabric of Japanese society. Long takes picturing Kambei and Kyuzo, however, underline Kurosawa's privileging of the samurai. These shots support the argument voiced by several Japanese critics who complain that Kurosawa was an elitist. Kurosawa was hardly a progressive director, they have argued, since his peasants could not discover among their own ranks leaders who might rescue the village. Instead, justifying the inequitable class structure of their society and ours, his villagers must rely on the aristocracy, the upper class, and in particular samurai, to ensure their survival. <laughs> It seemed to these critics a contradiction that Kurosawa, despite his supposed left-wing orientation, would assume a great man view of history and the position that ordinary people lack the ability to sustain their own community against threats from the outside. Tadao Sato, in particular, objected to Kurosawa's view that only a handful of people are great. Sato complained at a Kyoto panel discussion in which I participated with him and director Nagisa Oshima that there is too great a gap between the central figure and the others. Worst of all, the farmers are too stupid. Kurosawa defended himself against this charge in his interview with me. Quote, I wanted to say that after everything, the peasants were the stronger, closely clinging to the earth. He told me when I met him in Tokyo a few days after that panel discussion, quote, it is the samurai who are weak because they were being blown by the winds of time. 
There have also been critics who objected to Kurosawa's very use of the period film because by definition it glorifies Japan's feudal past and hence justifies a modern Japan attracted toward militarism, imperialism, and an acquiescence in the values of the modern nation-state. Nagisa Oshima has criticized Kurosawa and the directors of his generation for pandering to a sense of congeniality enjoyed by the audience, the consolation of their all being Japanese. Bitterly, Oshima has objected to Kurosawa and others fostering a sense of nostalgia, resignation, and an acquiescence in traditional modes of thinking, which encourage the perpetuation of a feudal mentality. For Oshima, despite the bite of Kurosawa's films, they do little more than accept the political status quo. They do not demand changes of consciousness that alone would lift the audience out of feudal modes of thinking. Seven Samurai seems to end on a moment of defeat, justifying Oshima's objection. Yet, in a film like the 1963 High and Low, we may observe Kurosawa's strong sympathy for the oppressed through the understanding he offers the kidnapper. Earlier on this night, we saw a distinct change in the treatment of the samurai by the peasants. From outside the frame, a peasant handed Kambe a tray of delicacies, reiterating that Kikuchio had been right when earlier in the film he characterized the peasant class as wily, hiding rice, salt, beans, and sake while pretending that they had nothing. Not only that, but they have persistently hunted down wounded samurai, stripping them of their armor and their weapons. These they have hoarded along with the food, far from the praying eyes of the samurai who have come selflessly to help them. Peasants, Kikuchio had pointed out to the samurai, are mean-spirited, stupid, murderous people, if made that way by centuries of having been preyed upon by samurai. Yet samurai, their social betters, have stolen their food, raped their women, and burned their villages. These samurai resembled the bandits now preying upon the village, bandits who are samurai by birth and training, but as ronin, masterless and starving, have themselves fallen upon hard times. The ending of this penultimate sequence to the film shows the separation between peasants and samurai even more strongly. At first, it's Kambe who tries to reconcile Manzo to the fact that his daughter has lost her virginity and has been spoiled. Note that Manzo does not meet Kambe's eyes. Kambe realizes his failure and looks up and he's going to be rescued at this moment by Shichiroji, who comes in, and in a moment we're going to see the final match on action at which Shichiroji, too, tries to persuade Manzo that, after all, the same things happen among the aristocracy. They happen in castles as well, and this is not really a question of social class, but it doesn't do any good. Manzo cannot be persuaded. And this is one more moment, I think, where Kurosawa indicates that peasants and samurai can never truly understand each other, that their needs and interests are forever at odds. Kambe here indicates his embarrassment by rubbing his head. It's his characteristic gesture, body language, that we've seen throughout the film. In the crowd watching, note that we see Rikichi standing at the front. He is going to take over the role of attempting to reconcile Manzo because both Kambe and Shichiroji have failed. There's the match on action beginning where Shichiroji tries to tell Manzo that the same thing happens to people of the upper class, hoping that this will be consoling. There's also a contrast in this shot between movement and stasis that we've seen earlier in the film and several times in the film. The peasants are absolutely immobile in the background, watching as the characters in the foreground, lit in a very expressionistic way, take center stage. There's the match on action completed as Shichiroji walks away. Now Rikichi comes forward, and through the use of an extreme close-up, Rikichi gains prominence. He points out to Manzo that his daughter survives, unlike Rikichi's wife, who was kidnapped by the bandits and met her fate in shame. 
Rikichi's speech also offers a classic use of foreshadowing as Kurosawa prepares for the coda to Seven Samurai, where the peasants will emerge as triumphant despite Shino's weeping, which continues over the wipe to the next day and the final culminating battle. Here's Kurosawa again being like Eisenstein using an inanimate object. Here it's the bonfire to substitute for the human action. Note also that the rain is beginning to fall. Extremes of weather for Kurosawa express the fury, the transformations, and the personal agony endured by people at moments of historical change. His best films, From No Regrets for Our Youth, Through Rashomon, Ikiru, Seven Samurai, and his most underrated film, Record of a Living Being, made the year after Seven Samurai, are situated at these moments of historical transition. At such times, when one historical epoch is passing into extinction and the next has not yet fully come into being, there is turmoil, social chaos, and a disruption of traditional modes of life. It is here that Kurosawa locates his most compelling stories. As Kurosawa's persistent metaphor for such moments is an extreme of weather, so a hard driving rain opens the final sequence of Seven Samurai. This unrelenting rain affects a gloom over the final battle. It also provides irony since, after all, the bandits will be defeated. The larger theme emerges simultaneously. For Kurosawa, the rain also suggests that the heavens were releasing their sorrow at the demise of the samurai class. That historical tragedy, the passing into extinction of the samurai class, renders ironic the film's entire plot as well as the success of this particular battle. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final sequence opens not on a momentous issue, but on the joke that Katsushiro has at last passed over a man's crucial rite of passage, the sexual act, and so become a full-fledged man. That the joke is shared by peasants and samurai alike foreshadows a breakdown of class distinctions that at this point is as much the director's hope as it is a historical reality. Seven Samurai is finally, in its style, a hybrid, it is in part a true Jidai Geki, a meditation upon history. It is also social satire. Comedy erupts despite the seriousness of the issues with which Kurosawa is preoccupied. Domestic life, which supposedly was confined in Japanese cinema to the Shomin Geki or the Ofuna Cho, the home dramas in which Yasujiro Ozu excelled, appears in the family lives of the peasants, not only in the Manzo Shino relationship, but also in the family of the old granddad and in Rikichi's disturbed domestic life. Kurosawa freely mixes styles, moving seamlessly from one form to another. Seven Samurai seems like an exercise in realism, yet, in fact, the style is expressionistic. Horses' hooves would not clatter as they do on the soundtrack in such a muddy terrain. When the samurai die, in this final battle, Kyuzo and Kikuchio, who by the end of the film is treated as if he were as much a samurai as any of the others, both meet their fate. It is by the coming technology, by gunshots. Modern Japan appears on the horizon, even as the film remains firmly set in the Sengoku period of warring clans, the 16th century. We are both in the Sengoku Jidai, the age of the country at war, when civil wars would decimate Japan of samurai, and in the present, in the moral disarray of the Japan of his own time, following the Pacific War and the American occupation, Kurosawa suggests a collective spirit and a return to what it means to be Japanese, a renunciation of willful personal inclination in favor of a unified sense of community is more urgent than ever. Listen for a minute to the clatter of the horses' hooves and they're running through mud, which is again an example of Kurosawa's expressionistic use of sound. The horse's hooves even precede the appearance of the horses in the shot. Returning to the point I made earlier, among the qualities that make Seven Samurai so great a work of art is that sense of urgency and hope, Kurosawa's belief, which will disappear in his later, more flat and pictorial films like Ron and Kagemusha, that change remains possible. In 1954, Kurosawa still believed that people can rise to the historical challenge that by strength of will and a positive direction, they can overcome the entropy that will otherwise destroy both the society and themselves. From this point to the end of the film, every moment, every shot composition contains historical resonance. 
In an increasingly poignant homage to the dying samurai way of life, Kurosawa dramatizes the range of samurai skills. For example, Kambei enlists his bow and arrow. Meanwhile, Kurosawa draws upon the full panoply of editing techniques, beginning with Eisenstein's montage. Kambei's arrow is dispatched in one shot, only to strike home in another, so that the spectator perceives the moment of impact in that editing slate of hand invented by Eisenstein. Like the bandits' horses racing across the frame, Kurosawa's characters stride across a history beyond their control. Constantly, samurai values are invoked. Kikuchio planting a bouquet of swords, we'll see that in a moment, into the ground bespeaks the samurai ethos by negative example. The true samurai, whose sword represented his soul, would never enter into battle with a collection of stray weapons that had once belonged to other warriors. Kurosawa is using multiple cameras, the telephoto lens, diagonal motion within the shot, alternating between slowing down and speeding up, and using really illustrating for the spectator a clinic in filmmaking, every possible technique. And Kurosawa is abiding also by the view that film, in its essence, involves motion. So we see constant motion within the shot. Here, that diagonal log across the shot, again, indicates the kind of conflict Eisenstein was talking about. We have just seen Katsushiro kill his first man. Just as in the penultimate sequence, he had sexual intercourse for the first time, so now his initiation as a samurai is complete. Because for Kurosawa, the master-disciple relationship is so intrinsic to the social fabric, so vital an aspect of civilized social behavior, Katsushiro at once earns a disciple of his own, the peasant Rikichi, who is suddenly at his side, ready to take orders. The democratization of the idea of the master-disciple relationship that even a peasant might rise to heroism, at once frees Kurosawa from the criticism that by dramatizing heroism through the actions of a few great men like Kambei, he is receding into an elitism that is antithetical to progressive thinking. When Kiyuzo dies, and we'll see that shortly, and flings his sword to the heavens, Kurosawa will enlist the long shot, the technique, a perfect analog to his insistence that only in the collective is their strength. In death, as in life, Kiyuzo is one among many. Never has he succumbed to the narrowness of pride in his considerable accomplishments, or putting the exercise of his formidable skills at the service of a personal and selfish need for honor or glory. The death of Kiyuzo seems to ignite Kikuchio to ever more strenuous battle. Kikuchio is shot, but he still goes on to spear the bandit chieftain who dies holding one of the guns he is unable to use. Realism once more has vanished, but Kurosawa here is protesting the coming world ruled by military technology, one devoid of samurai grace and ethics, and so he allows himself this respite into poetic justice. A moment later, realism returns and Kikuchio dies. At once, Kurosawa offers Kikuchio homage through Kambei's reaction. Kyucho! Kyucho! It's exactly the same as that Kambei offered to a hereditary samurai, to Gorobe, when he was shot. Kikuchio, Kikuchio. The long take of a dead Kikuchio lying in the mud, in its shot composition is ironic, since it recalls the death of the kidnapper who had taken a baby hostage in the early part of the film. The film proper ends on a shot of the flag. It's the flag that was sewn by Heihachi earlier in the film, symbolizing the unity of peasants and samurai. Here we see the flag flapping in the hard wind blowing as Kurosawa once more lifted the film out of its 16th century setting onto the wider stage of Japanese history. 
Seventh Samurai concludes with an extraordinarily lyrical coda, an elegy to the beauty and dignity of samurai values. Kurosawa uses weather ironically in the coda. We are in full sunlight, from the vantage, it seems, of the peasants now triumphantly planting the next rice harvest. But the camera is above them, enabling Kurosawa to distance himself from the point of view of the peasants, who can do no more than resume their egocentric lives. Kurosawa himself finds no particular comfort in the peasants' success, in their now being free to live, committed to nothing more than their own narrow survival, as they have always been. Seven Samurai has finally been not about the peasants and the needs of the village to continue, although Kurosawa opened the action on them and their plight. Rather, its central theme has been the fate of the samurai class and the transcendence of the samurai ethos of common purpose. It won't be until 1868 that the samurai class will officially depart from the stage of history. The three samurai stand on a raised hillock over the rice paddy as Kurosawa reasserts their moral authority. When he cuts to them from behind, showing us their backs, Kurosawa suggests that their presence has become superfluous. As they have no place in the village, so they will not survive in the wider context of Japanese society. They must resume their wanderings as ronin, wanderings that predict the moment when the samurai class will become entirely obsolete. In classical style, Kurosawa must offer one last reprise to the love between Shino and Katsushiro, and so she passes him, one among many women on their way to take their places in the rice planting ritual. Katsushiro turns to watch her and then follows. If only momentarily he separates himself from his fellow samurai, as he separated himself earlier in the film by defying the code of Bushido involving himself with a peasant woman. Kurosawa does not now permit Katsushiro and Shino to occupy a shot together, as their connection must be severed. There is no possibility of their being together again, and both of them know it, without a word being exchanged between them. Shino, sloshing through the mud of the rice paddy, moves without grace. She is a peasant, steeped in the mannerisms of her class. Shino, the peasant class, endure in contrast to the samurai. She is shot from a low angle looking up at her, however, capturing Kurosawa's final word on the peasant class. Shino's voice is loud and defiant, proclaiming the role history has afforded her and her class. Kambei begins with a paradox, even as the entire film has been a paradox. Samurai, whose hereditary obligation has been to conduct warfare on behalf of a daimyo, a feudal lord, are fighting for the peasantry with no gain to be had. Instead, they are participating in a process that furthers their own coming inevitable obsolescence. Non-diegetically, the samurai motif returns to the soundtrack, pushing off the peasant song. Finally, the samurai theme takes over completely in a moment of tribute. Kurosawa is sounding a note of the triumph of the samurai, not through battles won, but through the long lens of history when their full value is celebrated. Kurosawa is bidding farewell to the men as individuals and to the social force, the code they embodied to the fullest. He is bidding farewell, not least, to the heart of what had been for centuries the best of the Japanese identity, the culture at its most unique. In 1954, Kurosawa urges that the post-war audience look for direction to the samurai, not as a brutal, violent, glory-seeking group, but to the samurai as he was at first conceived, a figure of selfless integrity, one devoted to the collective, for whom courage, fortitude, asceticism, and self-sacrifice had become as second nature, a Japanese in the most authentic sense of that term. <laughs>